Hey folks, we have a very special guest today. His name is Stephen Nafee. He is the Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Jackson Pollock, an American saga, and Van Gogh, The Life. He is also an artist whose work is featured in museums around the world, including the Columbus Museum in Ohio, the Princeton University Art Museum in New Jersey, the Jamil Art Center in Dubai, and many more. We are very pleased to have him on the show to talk about these biographies and about his own artwork, Uh, and please enjoy. So, first off, I just want to, I'm glad we could be doing this, I want to thank you. Uh, We're here with Stephen Nafee, uh, the author of uh, Van Gogh, Jackson Pollock, among other books, an artist in his own right. And uh, thank you very much for being with me today. I'm really happy to uh, discuss these uh, the books with you, Duncan. Great. Uh, so since we have a lot to talk about, we can probably just get right into it. Um, I wanted to, to start off with um, you grew up as the son of career U.S. diplomats. You lived abroad. You got to explore all over the Middle East, Africa. And certainly those places had a profound influence on your art. And I want to get into that. Um, But before we do, I want to speed ahead just a little bit to the point where you met your future husband and writing partner, the late Gregory White Smith, um, who I hear one of the first points uh, you two bonded over was the fact that you were both in law school, um, but you both knew that you didn't want to be lawyers. Is that correct? That that is correct. Uh, A lot of people who don't know what they want to do when they grow up, um, and who do reasonably well in college end up going to law school, it's sort of a, a delaying tactic. It basically puts off the hard decision about what you're going to do for a career. And uh, I sort of wanted to be a museum director or go in the foreign service. He, um, gosh, I'm really not sure he had settled on anything, but it became really, two things became clear to me early on. One was that uh, there was a lot of uh, talent among our peers there at the law school. Um, there were, and, and one of the qu- quick and most important lessons we learned at law school was that there are different kinds of intelligence. And uh, just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean you're good at another. Greg would have made a great lawyer. I really didn't. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I would have. Um, Greg uh, reads very, very slowly and carefully. I read very quickly. That's great for researching a book. It's not great for reading a contract. And um, I also saw in some of the early things he had to write uh, as a student there at Harvard Law School, just how brilliantly he wrote. And um, there were plenty of people who wrote very adequate legal prose. Um, But there aren't that many people who write really spectacular really gorgeous nonfiction prose. And it increasingly seemed like a significant um, misuse of his talent to spend his whole life writing legal briefs when there were plenty of other people who who could do it as well. Um, And I began to push him in the direction of of writing and of writing together. Uh, It very quickly also became clear that um, we we each had sort of skill sets, both of which were necessary to writing nonfiction. One was research and the other was writing. And um, uh, we began early on to write some pretty commercial books to help pay for tuition. And uh, we, at the, even that early on, we divided the task. I would go out and do the research and he would do the writing. Um, we finished law school, but even by the time we, we graduated, in fact, I went off and did a PhD program in art history. He went off and did a pro, uh, a master's program in, uh, education. We still hadn't completely settled on writing as a career. I sort of, by that point really thought I'd be a museum director and he thought he might be the president of a college. Um, but we we had already begun writing commercial books. We kept on getting contracts for new ones, and that began to seem like a better, 
um, happier life than running institutions. And I'm very glad we made that choice. Yeah. So I think um, a lot of people definitely have that experience where they kind of just go into a career path because it's uh, either safe or there's like a predetermined route. Um, but obviously, YouTube broke out of that. Was there a, a specific moment uh, or what were those earlier years like? Did you have a long term vision of, you know, you wanted to do these big biographies and no, what? Early, early on, it was just uh, it was just doing uh, the fact that we landed a contract. A friend had an idea for a book and another friend had an agent and um, I landed the contract. The friend who had the idea for the book um, ended up having a terrible cocaine habit. And <laughs> this was a kid at law school. And um, um, uh, so that didn't work out. So right. I asked him if he uh, might want to help me with the book. And we did. We wrote it in about three weeks. Um, it was a guide to basically on how to be a yuppie. Um, it wasn't the stuff of great literature. But it did. I think we earned $10,000, which seemed like all the money in the world back in 1975. Right. And um, so all of a sudden we were we we had publishers who took notice of the fact that we could supply them with a commercial book and that we would could meet deadlines and that we could write. And we had an agent who was uh, a relatively known presence in the New York publishing world. So when we needed more money for more tuition, we wrote another book and then another. And all of a sudden, without even knowing it, we were writers. I think this is sort of. Uh, uh, potentially an interesting topic for people of your generation. I, I think you're probably about 40 years younger than I am. So you're like two generations younger. And uh, from what I read in, in the papers, um, people in your generation are not going to be able to follow the same simple, straightforward career paths that were available to people in my generation. You know, when we were growing up, you could become a doctor, a lawyer, um, an engineer, um, or go into the foreign service or what have you. And it was all pretty straightforward. My, from what I read, the average person who's in college today will end up having nine different career paths. Um, and given the effects that artificial intelligence are having on, on, um, on the world and in specifically on the, on the employment world, and given the pace of change, uh, it is hard to imagine that that uh, everyone who's now in college will be able to stay with the same uh, career path. And therefore, um, resiliency may replace stick to as a key factor in in uh, establishing a life's work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think maybe... Greg and I happened into it. People in your generation may have to uh, may have to do it, um, and that is be flexible and take advantage of the opportunities that that uh, come to you. Um, uh, I, who it was a, a really a, a fortuitous that a friend of mine had an agent. Fortuitous that a friend had an idea for a book, and therefore we were able to get started. And then we just took advantage of opportunities. But uh, to your qu question, we really didn't see the arc of a career at that point. Um, we had written a couple of sort of silly commercial books, and uh, it was sort of fun, but it certainly wasn't uh, a better use of Greg's writing skills than, than writing Supreme Court briefs. Um, and we decided we should write some. Actually, to tell you the truth, uh, Phil Donahue, the talk show host, had played a role here. We knew him. Really? And we ended up um, writing a book for him. And Greg wrote a five-part uh, primetime television series for NBC for Phil. And uh, uh, we were beginning work on that series. And um, uh, it, was, it made us more money than some of the earlier commercial projects. But he came to our apartment once and saw the book jackets of some of the early books we did. And I remember his wonderful phrase. He was, he was, he, no one in American television history, I think has been able to put complex thoughts in pithier form 
than Phil Donahue. It was really a form of genius. He's still around. He's still doing it, and uh, just not on television. Anyway, he looked at the book jackets and he said, "Which of these books would you want, um, you know, uh, place on your coffins as they're lowered into the ground?" Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the answer, of course, it was a rhetorical question. And Greg and I had already begun thinking about doing uh, something more serious, but it certainly um, fueled <laughs> that uh, ambition to work our way out of these commercial projects. And um, I had, we both loved biography. Um, I was a particular fan of it. <clears throat> and the um, middle to late 20th century was a really great period for biography. Uh, I think most people may not realize that biography as we know it, which is not only a, a, um, a recounting of the events of a life, but a kind of psychological exploration of the person, <clears throat> is really a, a, um, a creation of the late 19th century and of Lytton Strachey, the author of a book on a biography of Queen Victoria, and also the f famous book *Eminent Victorians*, which was a collection of brief biographies, was really the first person to do an intentionally psychological profile of a subject. Um, and from Strachey flowed an increasing number and increasingly sophisticated group of biographies. So that by the middle of the 20th century you're beginning to get books like William Manchester's um, um, biographies um, culminating in his epic and ma majestic three-volume biography of Winston Churchill, and also Robert Caro, who had won the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Robert Moses, uh, the city planner, had begun his multi-volume and extraordinary biography of Lyndon Johnson. And... Um, that became the example. We wanted to do something like that. And given my background in art history, I had studied it both at Princeton and then at Harvard. Um, we decided to write a biography of an artist. So the first of the two major biographies um, with Pollock, uh, he still had friends and relatives alive. So how did you, I mean, how did you go about like beginning this biography? What was the reaction from the family? Um, sure. Yeah, if you could just talk about that. The, um, well, for first of all, picking uh, Pollock was selecting him as a subject was the first step. And uh, in some ways it was a very easy choice. I had studied him in, in graduate school. Um, I liked the art. Interestingly, Greg didn't. Greg wasn't a fan and only became one over the 10 year period that we spent writing the book. I mean, he ended up becoming, uh, um, an enormous admirer of Pollock's achievement and of his work, but he didn't begin that way. Um, I, I began with an appreciation for the work. Um, but when you're picking a biologic, uh, a biological subject, <laughs> a biographical subject, <laughs> I guess there may be a little bit similar. Um, there are several factors that people may not think of if they haven't approached selecting a biographical subject, which most people wouldn't have. And that is, um, it seems obvious in retrospect, but it didn't seem obvious until we began to think about it. And that is, the person has to leave, lead a fairly interesting life, meaning that no one wants to read 400 pages, let alone 900 pages, on a person who led a boring life, no matter how important the work. And I can give you an example we considered later doing a biography of Winslow Homer because we liked the work so much. But it turns out, other than moving a, a good deal, the life really wasn't that interesting. So you want somebody who's got, whose life is compelling. You also want a, a, a someone who's, who's achieved something significant, meaning, again, that people are not going to read, and you're not going to want to spend 10 years of your life studying somebody who didn't really change the arc of history in some way. And there are plenty of good painters who painted really dazzling works who didn't really change the uh, the course of of art. And but Pollock did. I mean, th there is art before Pollock and art after Pollock to a certain extent. 
And um, so that was important. But second, you need um, you also want a kind of connection between the art and the life. You don't you you want an artist um, whose work in some way is in, uh, is uh, clarified um, by the the circumstances of the life. You know, there are certain abstract painters whose work is 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 shaped only minimally by the circumstances of their life. Um, uh, uh, but, but for the life to be significant, it needs to, it, it needs to be not only interesting, but it needs to be influential on what the, the, the artist achieved. And finally, and you spoke to this already, um, you need to be able to get the information, meaning there has to be uh, um, enough, enough, enough resources to be able to reassemble the life. Now that can happen two ways. Either the, the artist and the people around him can leave a lot of letters and memoirs and journals and uh, uh, other materials, written materials, or in the case of both Lyndon Johnson and for us, Jackson Pollock, you can begin your work when the artist, um, w- when the people who knew that artist are still alive. And we began Pollock about 1981, and he had been born in 1912. So even though he died quite young, um, at age 44, in fact, um, in 1952, um, or 56, rather, most of the people in his life were still alive. Uh, His second oldest brother, unfortunately, Sandy Pollock, the, the brother just older than Jackson out of the five boys had died young as well, but the three oldest brothers were still alive. His wife, Lee Krasner was still alive. Most of his close friends were still alive and most of the people in his circle were still alive. So uh, we were able with Jackson Pollock to uh, engage in an oral history and to establish uh, an oral record that substituted for the absence of letters and memoirs and journals. And uh, in some ways uh, with, with Van Gogh, obviously we had to turn to the written record because he had died so long ago, but I really in some ways enjoyed the oral history more. It was so exciting to talk to someone and um, who had known Pollock and to interview them, it's in some cases for weeks. I interviewed the family members for as long as three or four weeks, you know, starting at nine in the morning and ending at six at night, um, wow. every day f- for days on end. And uh, you were uncovering details, some of them sometimes crucial details that had li- that were literally nowhere in the literature. So it was like archaeology. You were discovering a buried past. And I I had gotten a sense from reading about Caro's interviews for the Johnson biography, just how exciting this might be. But it was even more exciting than I than I anticipated. I ended up interviewing more than 800 people. And we were able to really flesh out this complicated life almost entirely. And I mean, we, we it was sad not to have um, the inner monologue of the subject himself. You know, we didn't right. have Pollock talking about what he was thinking. It, it, we uh, we had to infer everything from the people around him. But st- that was still uh, an astonishing experience. It was one of the more exciting periods of my life. And um, it helped that so many of the people around Pollock were so darn verbal. I mean, they were articulate. They were knowledgeable. They were still young enough to have very good memories. Um, They were in their 70s. They were old enough to be retired, however, and therefore they looked forward to someone coming in and talking to them. Many of the other artists were peeved that yet again they were talking about Jackson Pollock's work and not about their own, but they were still just grateful to have someone take an interest in their lives in any way. And um, it was it was it was the perfect subject for us. So let's go into Jackson Pollock's life a little bit. And he obviously had a he, he had a lot of psychodrama 
going on. And um, he later had this mythology as someone coming out of, you know, sort of like a cowboy coming straight out of the Old West. How much did that image of himself match up to his early childhood experiences? Well, uh, he certainly capitalized, and the people creating the public relations um, messaging for him as he developed this this really major position in art history were fascinated by this quote unquote cowboy past. Uh, you have to remember that so many of the artists of his generation weren't American by birth. You know, Willem de Kooning was Dutch. Uh, Mark Rothko was from Russia. Arshil Gorky was Armenian. And some of the others like Mark Rothko, I believe was born in this country, but uh, was from New York, you know, not from the hinterland. Uh, Clifford still came from the West, but he wasn't as major a figure as, as Pollock. And Pollock came from, was, was born in Wyoming of all places. And, uh, and he grew up all over the West in Arizona and California. And, you know, he wasn't in any way, his father was, a, was for uh, one, we've had many jobs, but he was a, uh, uh, he, he raised sheep in, in Wyoming, but wasn't really a cowboy. And, but Pollock himself, who certainly didn't work on a, um, wasn't a cowboy, you know, did grow up on a ranch in, in, in Arizona. And when they were in California, especially when he was, uh, in middle school in, um, in Riverside, uh, he would go with some, some, uh, friends and, uh, friends of his father's and went to a couple of, um, at least one Mustang hunt. So he, you know, there are pictures of him wearing a cowboy hat and with a gun in his hand. I don't know that he ever shot anything bigger than a rabbit, but, uh, you know, there, it, there was just enough act, you know, so his sort of historical, framework and, and and at least a couple of pictures that made it uh plausible to to create this fantasy of a cowboy painter. Yeah, and he had um with his parents, he had kind of a to put it mildly a strange dynamic with his mother that she was sort of the I think you've described her as the the alpha female of the house and the father who was basically in the background and later on absent entirely could you talk a little bit about their different parenting styles? What effect that may have had on him? Yeah, people ask us, you know, what, what we considered most important in understanding a life. Yeah, I, I think we would argue, Greg and I would, that um, you know, no one factor explains anyone. I was thinking the other day, uh, so much of life is DNA, and so much of it is uh, childhood experience, and a, a lot of it is also just accident. But to pick up on the nurture side of the nature nurture dilemma. Yeah, you know, I think the the families that we grow up in are, are crucial to all of us. I mean, we we sort of know it when we when we try to understand how our friends and loved ones are behaving. You know, it uh the kind of childhoods they had are really important in in most cases in how they behave as adults. I mean, this is a fact not just of famous people but of all of us. And um, so in Pollock's case, you do have what you described is a, a household in which there was a very strong mother and uh, an often absent father. The, 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 this, there, this was partly by force of circumstance. This was, you know, a, a, the family was poor and um, some of it was during the Depression. <clears throat> the father had to take whatever jobs he could get. Uh, he worked on a road crew. He worked on this sheep ranch, um, he worked on uh, in a variety of menial jobs and often had to leave the house to, to take them. Uh, the, he and, he and uh, Roy Pollock was his name. He and Stella, the mother, also didn't get along terribly well. And Roy had a, a drinking habit. And the mother was more or less happy to have him outside the house. So, but you, you can already begin to imagine from that, the dynamics in that household. You have five boys with an absent, slightly weak father and a very strong, very present mother. And um, so you have inevitably 
the combination of a strong maternal influence and a deep desire to make a connection with the father. And Greg and I would argue that, 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 that this is very helpful in understanding not only who Pollock was emotionally, but also had an impact on the art in a way. Emotionally, he was constantly looking for the mother's attention. In a family that large with that little money um, and with a, an accomplished first son, often much of the family's energy goes into, into that first son. And Pollock's oldest brother, Charles, was both rather charismatic as a young man, as, as a late adolescent. He had a lot of girlfriends. He, he, started, he showed an interest and a skill in drawing from a very early age, took lessons early on, even in Arizona when they were in this pathetic little farm. And the mother encouraged him completely uh, to the father's dismay because he couldn't imagine how Charles was going to earn a living as an artist. The, the mother encouraged him completely. Uh, th this is one of the more interesting facts in American early cultural history is that the arts were seen as a, as a, um, as a, a, as the domain of America's women, not of America's men. And they were, they, uh, 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 even rather poor American women, women living on farms, for example, took a, an astonishing level of interest in, um, in the arts, both in music and writing and in uh, the visual arts. <clears throat> and these were cultivated by the women's magazines. Um, and also there were itinerant speakers and itinerant teachers who would go through the, the, uh, the American the vast American expanse and make themselves available to, you know, the mothers and wives out there. Uh, Stella Pollock took a, uh, a watercolor course when she was a young girl in Tingley, Iowa, uh, from some itinerant teacher. Uh, so even though the father wanted these boys to become uh, helpful on the farm when he was living with them, and he wanted to see them develop a, a successful manly um, career, the mother was there arguing just the opposite, encouraging Charles to become an artist. And um, Jackson, as, as, as the youngest, Jack and Jackson had a slightly favored place because he was the baby and um, was sort of spoiled a bit by all the older brothers and even by the mother. But Charles was, still came first and Pollock became an artist in no uh, small measure because Charles had been an artist. In fact, right. his brother Sandy once said, if Charles had been a plumber or a tennis player, Jackson would have become a plumber or a tennis player and not an artist. But if you, if, there are also connections to the art, I think, uh, or, or what Greg and I would call resonances. The, the book stirred up a certain amount of controversy uh, and one of the more controversial details, although we were not the first to publish it, uh, was the fact that when Jackson stood up from his first drip painting, he told a friend, a, pa a woman named Patsy Southgate, who was married to the writer Peter Matheson, that the first image he had was of his father urinating on a flat rock. Right. And he determined that that experience took place in Arizona when Jackson and... Um, Frank and his father were hiking and uh, saw some Indian ruins. And this would have been the, the, uh, the day that Jackson would have seen this. And, uh, you know, we argued it, or we didn't argue it. We, we put it in the book, one, because it was one of the very few things that Jackson himself said about his own art. He was not articulate or verbal. Um, this was a rare occasion in which he talked about his paintings. So we, we put it in the book, not just because he said it and it was uh, a rare statement, um, but we put it in there because we thought psychologically it had not, it, it's not so much that it triggered the drip paintings. There were many, many triggers, but that it created a resonance between what Jackson was doing in his art and his father. Interestingly, we also, we paired that with the influence of his mother. His mother was a seamstress, among other things. She loved baking. She loved sewing. She was, um, she loved being a housewife and mother. And um, 
the strongest image for all of the Pollock boys of their mother was of her on the ground, rolling out a bolt of fabric, patting it down and cutting out the pieces for a piece of clothing, whether for a shirt or a pair of pants. And um, so it's, again, there was a resonance there when J Jackson, who not only, you know, established the drip technique, but also uh, in order to, to make his drip paintings, had to paint them on the floor. You know, the fact that he would take um, bolts of canvas and un unroll them on the floor, pat them down, and begin uh, this intricate lace-like imagery. You know, the, the mother, in addition to sewing clothes, did lace work. Um, so both the, the act of, unfur of unfurling a bolt of material and the intricacy of the image, you know, create a resonance with the mother. And just as the, the peeing on the rock created a resonance with the father, um, again, we don't think these, you know, they explain everything by any means about the art, but they do explain why this technique and this style had a power for him that it might not have had for some other painter. Yeah. So as for why you mentioned his older brother and his older brother being into art and he obviously had to compete for attention and that was a big part in why he got into art in the first place. But it seems like when you read about like Van Gogh, it seems like he really enjoys painting and that it was something that provided him a lot of joy. I don't know if I necessarily get that sense from Pollock. Were, were there reasons for his interest in art besides purely psychological? Yes, I, I think um, it's clear that Pollock had a significant, uh, what, what's called in the art world, a significant eye. And um, meaning that he, even though he wasn't articulate about art, so we don't have, um, as we do with Van Gogh, examples of him talking about the work of Picasso or the other artists he was looking at. We know from accounts, both from his wife, Lee Krasner, and from his friends who went to art galleries with him, that that you know he had uh, he he could focus an enormous amount of emotional and intellectual and artistic energy on, on looking at, at art, and also had a terrific um, ability to discern quality in art. In fact, his f closest friend, a man named Ruben Kadish, said that when Pollock looked at anything in the world, not just a painting, but just a, you know some matchsticks and an ashtray on a table, he just saw more than most of us see. So I think there was uh, an innate uh, ability, uh, you know, uh, capacity for seeing something also that uh, Van Gogh had, and I think is probably uh, typical of art. All artists, it's such a it's so, so integral to making art is looking at art and seeing art and seeing the world perhaps more intensely than many of us do. Pollock had that, and uh, but what he didn't have. Is and I think this may speak to your point that he doesn't look like he's enjoying what he's doing. I think that's tr maybe not so true later in his life, or at least in the middle period of his career when he was painting actively and effectively and so successfully. But when he began, he simply didn't have the skills of a draftsman. Uh, you know, just about any student who goes to art school, at least in that period, the first thing they made you do was learn how to draw. For, um, and you went through a very uh, disciplined program, beginning with drawing from plaster casts and then eventually working your way to the human uh, form. And the typical art student developed a, a minimal capacity to render the human form. Uh, Pollock just didn't have that. He studied at the Art Students League. Again, like everything, he did that because his, father, his brother uh, Charles was, had gone to the Art Students League and had befriended uh, uh, Thomas Hart Benton, uh, the teacher there, Pollock was never able to draw a face that looked like a face in the way not only that Charles did brilliantly, but that most typical art students did. What's interesting, of course, is that through sheer force of pers personality and of uh, a kind of charisma 
and ambition, Pollock overcame those problems. He became Benton's favorite student, despite the fact that he was one of his least accomplished students. And he became one of the great artists of all time, despite his lack of skill in the basic talent of, of draftsmanship, or at least draftsmanship as we traditionally knew it. Yeah, when it comes to sort of like those men around him, uh, like Thomas Hart Benton, you mentioned his older brother, Charles, and all of his older brothers. They were all pretty successful with women. And Jackson himself was, I mean, a good-looking guy, but he was not as successful there. Was that just a product of his generalized social anxiety was he interested in women or is there something deeper going on there? Well, uh, I, I certainly think his lack of social skills um, had, uh, had a role. But what, one of the more controversial uh, uh, elements of the book is that Greg and I pretty early, in fact, in the third interview, heard that he was gay. Uh, a, a man named Peter Busa, a painter who had been at the Art Students League and who was a roommate of Pollock's briefly in their um, – early in Pollock's stay in New York, told us that when we were disc discussing Jackson's emotional and mental problems, that he thought a lot of it had to do with him being gay and being incredibly uncomfortable with it. Uh, you know, we have to remember that uh, Pollock was born in 1912. This was, you know, way before, you know, in, the, in, in your generation, it's not really that big a deal. In Pollock's generation, it was a huge deal, and especially in a kind of a farmer rancher family, where for and and it magnified by the fact that Roy Pollock was rather small. So po Roy Pollock himself, the father, was constantly comp uh, compensating for his diminutive size with a particularly masculine outlook on life and a particularly mm -hmm. uh, masculine persona. And, and, and life, uh, you know, these very rugged, manly activities, ranching and farming. And, um, and he was pretty f horrified. Um, effeminacy was really high on his list of, of the things he found re repellent. And um, when Greg and I heard that in the third interview, we were really pretty um, upset, <laughs> not because – in, in fact, in part because we were gay, and this was early enough in in the sort of trajectory of acceptance of homosexuality in our country that we knew that if we said anything along these lines, it would it would we would get it, uh, at least some pushback, and um, uh, and it would create a certain amount of controversy. So we sort of hoped this was an uh, an eccentric and inaccurate assessment by Peter, but the the, the topic kept coming up. And in fact, his, we spoke with, at length with one of his psychiatrists, a woman who was in her late 90s by the time we spoke to her, but completely coherent, a Swiss woman who had been in New York when Pollock saw her for more than a year. And she, she was quite clear on the subject. We heard from two close friends of Lee's that she was always of the opinion that Pollock was gay. And interestingly, and we heard this from no from no less a source than Clement Greenberg, who knew her quite well. That um, that uh, although Greenberg didn't see Pollock's sexuality, but Greenberg told us, um, and it bears up under scrutiny, that most of the men in um, in Lee's life before Pollock were gay, and most of the men in Lee's life after Pollock were gay. And um, <laughs> but we also heard it from people like Reuben Kadish, his best friend, um, who was. Uh, not only you know very straight, but uh, incredibly honest and knew Pollock as well as anyone. So at a certain point, uh, and we heard it from quite a few other people, we also checked, we, we, we researched the women in his life. And uh, we, f we found out uh, that Bert Pacifico, the first uh, girl girlfriend, never had any intimacy with Pollock. He had a girlfriend named Rose Millar. We checked that out, and there was no intimacy there. And um, his girl, his last girlfriend, Ruth Kligman, the mistress before he died, uh, just before he died, told a friend of hers that they never had sex. So we're down to Lee, and we we understand yeah. that Lee um, had um, 
there was about a year when they had a, a relatively intimate relationship. But I think you're beginning to see the complex uh, complexity of his of his uh, sexuality, and you know why this is important is because I think it, it's it's not only is sexuality an important part of all of our personas, but um, in in the case of Pollock and in the era in which he lived, it it was one more factor for, um, in making him making his life complicated and difficult. I mean uh, the the interactions he had we had several accounts of sexual events with men but they tended to be drunken and uh, events that led to a good deal of self-loathing well yeah I, I wanted to ask about that some of them seemed like they were when he was like riding the rails when he was a kid or there was a scene in the book where these guys just come in like a pickup truck and like pick them up and basically dump them on the front door after they're done and is, is it was it like predatory yeah, it seems like he was kind was, of the victim of some of it was predatory and 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 not voluntary i think you know, the first incident you're describing is when he was riding the rails and there are numerous accounts eric severide the uh, cbs reporter talked about it and said how young men were um were susceptible to rape when they were in these box cars where there was a kind of prison atmosphere in these box cars in which in the depression when men rode the rails and Pollock admitted to Peter Busa that that had happened to him. Um, the other event was at the end of his life and it was described to us by Nicholas Caron, a significant abstract expressionist who only died a couple of years ago. And um, it was, a, that was a much weirder circumstance, but there were uh, a, a other Examples during his uh, uh, the rest of his life, uh, um, we were told about a, a, another painter, uh, a man from New Orleans who was married to a lesbian, who with whom Pollock had a relationship of sorts. And without going into the details, we understand you know sort of what they did. And uh, I don't know how much of it was uh, lubricated with alcohol, but so many of Pollock's interactions with people of any kind required a certain amount of al alcohol to get them started. So, you know, I, it, it's uh, to your, I think, to, to the point, your, the, your underlying point, yes, if, if all of the experiences had been predatory with Pollock as the victim, that would be one thing. But there were other experiences that weren't predatory. And there were no interactions, sexual relationships with women. And uh, this is an, an era when when artists like Willem de Kooning were ladies' men and were attracting, you know, were almost like rock stars later. You know, they, they, the men at the Cedar Bar attracted a certain number of groupies who were available to them, and Pollock just didn't, was, didn't show any interest. So, uh, again, I don't want to make too much of this, but I do think that the, the kind of compensation that goes on. And the other figure who was, uh, the other person who was very clearly, uh, gay was Thomas Hart Benton himself, and you know Benton's in some ways even a more interesting example because he he depicted himself not as a painter but as a kind of man of the people who, in his own words, you know started off painting paintings of naked women for for um, for for um, bars and but you know the evidence from his wife and his son T P and from uh, the people who knew him and and so his life was one of compensation and. You know, I think it's really important to understand how difficult Pollock's life was, and this was one aspect of it. But you know, I, I, to to sort of expand the, the uh, a bit, you know, it, there were other sources of anxiety. This constant competition with with Charles, and even when he bested Charles, the the actual sibling, there was a constant sense of competition with the the, the art world. Um, you know, his competition was with de Kooning was was a, a sibling rivalry that um, picked up w with the world at large where it w left off with the actual brothers in his own family. So he never I mean, de Kooning's an interesting example here. You know, de Kooning was led a very satisfied, happy life. Uh, um, he was terribly accomplished. He was terribly well liked. He was very successful with women. He, uh, he understood just how good he was. Uh, I'm sure there were moments of self-doubt, as there are with all of us. But for Pollock, 
you know, comparing himself to de Kooning, it all just seems so much easier. And then you add to that certain lie, uh, uh, you know, the, the mental, the physical and mental problems, certain this very, very serious alcoholism. Uh, Greenberg called him an alcoholic in excelsis, a, a wonderful phrase. And, uh, you know, even when he went into a clinic to dry out, he used to keep a bottle of, um, of, uh, of whiskey in uh, the bathroom. He hid one in the bathroom, in, in the toilet, in the, in the tank. And even when he, during his periods of so-called sobriety in Long Island, when he was most productive, uh, because he couldn't paint when he was drunk, he always kept a, a, a bottle of, of cooking sherry buried in the ground so that he could get at it without Lee um, knowing it. So he was really, you know, the alcoholism was constant and he had other mental problems. I, I think today's inaccurate and, uh, or, or loose terminology would call him a borderline personality uh, or something on those lines. So you, you throw all that together, pl plus the fact uh, that, his, uh, that painting for him was not easy. Uh, it could be once he went in, was, was in something, but there were long periods between acts of creativity and of, and he could be get very excited about what he was doing, but then he would go into a fallow period and economically and commercially and in terms of public relations, you know, he was certainly among the first artists of his generation to, um, uh, to achieve renown. De Kooning famously said he broke the ice, which referred not just to his painting style, but also to his early um, and limited but still noticeable commercial success for the artists of their generation. Still, it never seemed completely successful to Pollock himself, and they were always uh, hurting for money. So it was uh, you, there. Uh, there, there are a lot of different traumas of which his sexuality was only one. You mentioned his psychiatrist. He went through a sort of a succession of therapists. One of them was this guy, Dr. Henderson, who was sort of a, a Jungian guy that didn't really treat his alcoholism, but it wound up with Jackson doing all these Jungian drawings or drawings full of that kind of imagery. What, what role did therapy play in his life or in his art? Did it help at well, all? I think it probably did help um, a little bit, but uh, you may know, and I certainly have known, Again, I keep thinking I'm at age 66. I've, I've been through a lot and I've known a lot of people and a lot of people in therapy. And a certain kind of person is really adept at, at, at taking control of their therapeutic relationship mm -hmm. from the therapist. Mm -hmm. um, I've known you know, quite a few people who walk into a therapist's office and figure out how to take control, by, not, of, not overtly, but covertly, and uh, by by saying what the therapist wants them to say. This is particularly important in Pollock's case, especially with Henderson, because Henderson uh, thought that he, uh, he, he wrote a book uh, about uh, his time with Jackson while Th Lee was still alive, and she was furious that he violated the um, confidentiality of his doctor-patient relationship. But what was, um, uh, in retrospect, slightly amusing is that Henderson was was thrilled to have a patient who exemplified all of his Jungian theories. He kept bringing in these drawings <laughs> that illustrated precisely the kinds of things that uh, Henderson was interested in. And Henderson, who was so lacking in self-knowledge that he didn't realize that he was basically um, giving Pollock the sort of uh, the hints as to what might be useful in his therapy, Pollock would go home, make a drawing that fulfilled all that perfectly, bring it back to Henderson. And Henderson would think that Pollock was making a huge amount of progress because he was coming up with these drawings that pointed out that he was uh, making this progress. Well, they were drawings that were um, seeded by what Henderson had said in the previous session. It was really pretty laughable, and it would all be more laughable if, as you mentioned, Henderson had not completely uh, avoided his responsibility in dealing with Pollock's alcoholism. You know, most responsible therapists literally wouldn't try to treat a patient for psychiatric problems while they're drunk 
And uh, Henderson was so thrilled with these drawings that he did. The other therapists, um, I think the, the Swiss woman I discussed probably had some positive effect because she became a kind of substitute mother figure for him and was capable of calming him down. But the person who had the most effect on him was not a, a, a professional therapist, um, but was a, um, well, there were, there were a couple of people. There was a doctor in East Hampton. There was one quack there, but there was also a doctor who was just a sort of a local pragni- practitioner who gave him, um, is it called Anabuse, the, the drug that uh, makes you sick if you drink? That was effective. Right. <laughs> that worked. The union drawings didn't do much yeah. good, but the Anabuse, that stopped him <laughs> from drinking a bit. And also there was this wonderful friend, um, Roger Wilcox, who was an inventor and an engineer who had been an alcoholic. And he used to take long walks with Pollock and c- convinced him that his life would be better off if he stopped drinking. And he kept and he told him, listen, every time you want to reach for a bottle, just come over to my house and we'll talk. And so I think that unprofessional therapy was really more effective than any of the professional therapy. And I, I don't want to miss the other key person in this whole um, uh, therapeutic situation. And that is his wife, Lee Krasner. She gave him the complete un, um, unalloyed, unconditional love that he didn't even get from his own mother. And she created a safe place for him to at least pull back on the amount of drinking he was doing, uh, which allowed him to have his career. So I think, you know, he found several people who, who helped him become comparatively or relatively sober periodically enough to have the career that he had and wouldn't have had it without them. His first sort of big uh, breakthrough, I guess you could call it, came with his uh, mural for Peggy Guggenheim. You've heard about the fact that this isn't information that you had at the time of your biography, but they've since done some forensic studies on it that showed that it probably was not painted in a single night, but that was a big part of his sort of painting mythology. Does that change at all uh, your understanding? Yes, it certainly does. I mean, one of the things that you learn, we were quite young when we began Pollock. We were about um, 30 and um, you, you, you grow up (laughs) with time and it wouldn't have occurred to us when we began the book that the book would inevitably have errors and you sort of you one of the things you realize as you get older is that there is no you know there there, nothing's ever perfect and and you can't write uh, a nonfiction book that is error free and uh you know you do the best you can with the material that's available to you the people we spoke with about the mural including lee krasner you know, told us that it was basically finished in one in, in one try, and I think in retrospect we now realize that was what you very nicely call part of his painting mythology. That it was a good story. That he sat there looking at this blank canvas forever and for a very long time until he absolutely had to paint it, and then in a burst of massive creativity, volcanic cr- creativity painted this huge and dazzling work, one of his first great large masterpieces. Um, it's a great story, but as you say, when they, the conservators cleaned it recently and worked on it at the Getty Conservation Center in Los Angeles, um, you know, they, they, they were able to detect that it was basically painted over a period of time. I think that changes the way we view the painting as an example of him as this volcanic creative figure but um, I don't think it changes the storyline dramatically overall. Okay. Sort of after that, uh, actually, I think it was like the night that the painting got installed, there was a, a party at Peggy Guggenheim's apartment, and he like started peeing in the flower pot. And I think the line in your book is that the, the demons had come back. But you mentioned that he never painted when he was drunk, and he also had this great anxiety about uh, every time he painted that he would have to create a a new fully formed masterpiece in its own right. Do you think he used alcohol as a way to sort of 
avoid his anxiety over uh, yes, not painting? I, I think uh, one reason he was never able to give up alcohol entirely is that he did find it necessary. He did occasionally paint when drunk. He just – it just wasn't any good. The, the best example, and we have – because we have such a remarkable – full account of it is the painting of blue poles. We have that account because Tony Smith was there, the artist and um, sculptor and architect, Tony Smith, a friend of his from New Jersey came up because he was in such bad shape that night. And uh, Smith was able to tell us about the painting of blue poles. And he was drunk when he did the painting, but he scraped off what he painted while drunk and started from scratch. And the painting that we now know, the painting that's in Australia is not what he painted when he was um, inebriated. And the peeing thing is sort of interesting. There, actually, there's sort of multiple questions uh, in your in your question. Uh, the peeing thing is interesting because it was not the first example that he peed in public. Uh, it's the most famous um, because he was surrounded by um, some of the art world's leading figures, uh, and they watched this remarkable display of exhibitionism and uh, inappropriate behavior. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, he was yeah. – uh, there There were any number of accounts of him peeing as we were re- – re- and, and one wouldn't necessarily hear this about every subject. I just finished the re- remarkable Brian Cranston LBJ um, film – and, you know, LBJ's bathroom habits were certainly uh, bizarre. And, you know, the fact that he wanted to go to the bathroom in public is, is, is a really interesting insight into his complex character. With Pollock, I mean, not only was it the Becky Guggenheim incident, but he peed in her bend once. And he, um, he peed from a moving truck once, people uh, from the back of a pickup truck people described and he peed on the snow and sort of created a Pollock painting on the snow once. And we were, we kept hearing examples of his public urination and, but this, yeah, the, the, we also heard from uh, Ruth Kligman, his mistress of sorts, although we don't think they had an actual intimate relationship that one of the bizarre things about him was that he peed from a seated position typically. So you have the combination of it peeing from a seated position in regular daily life, but all this sort of public urination. And again, it, it was one of the reasons why we thought that there's something going on here. And I don't think it requires too much Freudian analysis to understand that, that if this memory, that, that this memory of his father peeing, you know, resonated with him and this public peeing, I think was, was, you know, a, a, a way of him demonstrating his manliness. But uh, you also talked about his, the difficulty of, of the new work. I mean, there are two ways to paint. One is in a kind of careful, studied, um, thoughtful way, the way de Kooning did. Um, I don't know if anybody has seen the films of de Kooning painting, but they're, unfortunately there are not that many of them. But he, um, but he, he was. They, he didn't slash those things out. De Kooning would spend months staring at a painting and then occasionally adding a brushstroke to it. It was a very deliberate process, despite the fact that it was so organic in its results. Pollock, on the other hand, may have been less volcanic than we thought. If the you know, now that we know that the Guggenheim mural was painted over time. But he was also capable of painting something in one shot. The, the problem with that, with painting quickly like that, is that it does require a level of uh, inspiration that is hard to come up with. And there were periods of his time when, when he was inspired regularly, but there were many periods in his life when nothing came to him. There'd be, I mean, Lee was just constantly upset that he would have a show scheduled in two months and he hadn't begun painting for it yet. This was typical. And uh, very importantly, in the last years of his life, he be the, this, this idea that every painting had to be its own special thing became more exaggerated and more challenging. Uh, if you look at the last great paintings, they were painted over a long period of time and they're completely different from each other. They're not just variations and new variations on the same theme. You know, the uh, Blue Poles, um, the Deep, the great painting that's in Paris, uh, Easter and the Totem, uh, which is at the Museum of Modern Art. 
none of these paintings look anything like the other. Um, the deep really looks like a Clifford still only, in my opinion, and Greg's better than anything still ever painted. Eastern the Totem gave rise to Lee Krasner's mature work. Uh, so each one of these paintings could have established an entire body of work, but Pollock felt that once he'd painted that one painting, he had to come up with something completely new, and that uh, drive is terribly self-defeating because it's difficult to come up with an entirely new style. And uh, it became sort of um, self-defeating because he would paint the thing, paint this masterpiece, it would, it would completely fulfill its ambitions. And then he would desperately try to think of a new, completely different style that was every bit as good. And it led to long periods of not painting and that gave him more self-doubt and made it even more difficult to come up with the next great masterpiece. So, uh, yes, it, 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 his work, working style and his various mental and, and uh, drinking problems certainly meant that the career didn't unfold naturally. This is not Matisse or Picasso who could get up every morning and just go to work happily and productively. Um, I'm sure that's a slight exaggeration for both of those two painters, but comparatively, you know, the, the, both Picasso and, and Matisse painted with a, a certain degree of ease and, and uh, conviction and painted until they you know, lived fairly long lives and painted to the last minute. So um, Pollock didn't. And it, it certainly is an important factor as we look at the arc of the, of the work, um, which sort of petered out at the end, unfortunately. Yeah, so after he goes through this dark period after the mural, um, he eventually gets out of it after Lee, his wife, takes him to, to Springs. And he got sober, as you mentioned, for a period of time. He was taking those tranquil tranquilizers. He had Roderick Wilcox. And then he has sort of his his next big breakthrough, probably what he's known best for, which are the drip paintings. And you've already talked a little bit about the psychological influences that led to those paintings but could you talk about what i mean when people say his art is revolutionary led to you know you said art before and after pollock what exactly about the drip paintings that a lot of people say you know oh my five-year-old could do that what about them is so revolutionary well, I, I think or new? the point you're making and it's a good one is that they weren't completely original in the sense that dripping was was not unique to pollock Max Ernst and um, the surrealist painter and Hans Hoffman, the the teacher at the art uh, no at, at the Hoffman School, who with whom Lee Krasner had studied, had both dripped paint as an artistic effect, and in fact, a man named Schwankowski who taught in the in, in Jackson's high school had used uh, spilling of paint onto a, a horizontal surface as a way of getting his students interested in, in making something. I mean, they, he used it as a, as a trigger to experimentation with artistic technique. So there were examples of dripping before Pollock. He's, and, and, and the fact is you can't be in a studio without dripping paint. I mean, the, the, to our astonishment, some of the old masters painted very carefully. Uh, you know, we see these paintings of some of these uh, 19th century figures who are, you know, in suits while they're painting, but still it's hard not to drip paint occasionally. Whistler famously flung some paint at a, uh, at a canvas to create an image of fireworks. Uh, so the, the possibility of flinging or dripping paint was already there. It, what, what was revolutionary uh, in Pollock was that he took this artistic effect and turned it into its own style. And that's w what m made it easy to make fun of. I mean, there were people who simply couldn't couldn't see what Pollock was attempting and achieving, and thought, "My God, anyone can drip paint." And uh, you know, my five year old child, a chimpanzee. Um, and in fact, there were a lot of jokes about it uh, during J Jackson's lifetime, which you know further um, created even more doubt in his mind as to whether what he was achieving was really meaningful or not. But um, what, what Pollock did there, I mean, it, it, once you begin to see 
how good these paintings are, especially at their best, you really begin to see how much energy and compositional variation, but compositional unity, how uh, there is in these paintings, how much, uh, how elegant the handwriting is. I mean, it's one of the reasons why Pollock's paintings are among the most difficult to forge is it's, even though you, you can go out there and drip paint, it's incredibly difficult to create drips that are as, um, that have his signature uh, handwriting. But to your question about the you know, before and after, uh, one of the challenges of, of his drip, drip paintings is that they have no apparent subject matter. Now, it turns out, and one of the things we discovered is that in his head, there was, there was at least in Lee Krasner's uh, words, always a subject matter. In fact, uh, Nicholas Caron, who I've mentioned, um, also described the process where he was uh, often in these strip paintings, uh, painting three-dimensionally in space and letting the paint drop on the, on the canvas. So there was, if we're to understand both Krasner and Caron, a um, representational trigger to these strip paintings. But having said that, they're essentially completely abstract in a way that most other painting before Pollock wasn't. You know, uh, Picasso always had a model. It was never just out of uh, thin air. And it's particularly difficult it, uh, to paint something out of nothing. And Pollock created that challenge. Uh, he created both a challenge and, um, and, and provided a model for pulling an image out of, out of the air. So after he, has, he did what he did, all of the artists of his generation, or most of them, began to try to come up with their own imagery that was itself completely abstract so that you begin to get these signature styles, whether there are, they are Rothko's floating uh, rectangles or Clifford Still's jagged uh, shapes. And what, what's astonishing here is that this became the answer to Pollock's lack of skill as a draftsman meaning that because he could not compete with these other artists in drawing a face that looked like a face, he made that no longer necessary. In fact, he, for a while there, he made it unacceptable. There were all these painting, painters around him, including his brother Charles, who were these incredibly talented draftsmen, and Pollock made that old-fashioned. He made it sort of uh, uncool to paint this representational imagery and took these painters who had tremendous gifts as a draftsman, but didn't have the sort of uh, image-making skill that Pollock did and who really struggled to come up with abstract images to suit the new era that Pollock ushered in. So if, 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 you, if, you, come, if you look at it um, from, a, from a distance, you, you see this guy who couldn't do whatever all the other artists were doing, so he, he changes the whole uh, the, the game so that what he was good at became the, the, um, uh, the crucial aspect of, of creating a successful art. Uh, it's really an astonishing thing that, that he just, uh, he goes from being unlikely to have any career whatsoever to having the most important career by changing the whole nature of what it meant to make a, a work of art. Yeah, that's interesting because... Okay, so after after he creates this sort of burst of drip paintings, and he has, I think it's maybe like four or five years where his life is actually, relative to the rest of it, going pretty good. But then it uh, it does go downhill again, and it's sort of the final descent. I think the the most obvious catalyst was when he's at the Thanksgiving dinner with Hans Namuth, uh, the photographer who's taking pictures of him painting, and he you know flips the table and he starts drinking again he sort of had this a resentment i guess you could say of people who in his words thought it was easy to splash out a pollock and near the end of his life he asked someone he knew uh, about something he had just created like is this a painting and not as you state in your book is this a good painting but is it a painting at all do you think during this time 
or afterwards he ever felt like a fraud? And if so, was that magnified by participating yes, uh, in that you, photo you're, shoot? You're right on multiple counts there. One of the problems with painting a completely abstract image is that or a non-representational image is that it doesn't have the same um, set of obvious measures for success. Meaning that if you're if you're if you're looking at a John Singer Sargent, you know um, you can look at the accuracy with which he has depicted the subject, at the composition relative to compositions throughout the history of Western art, um, at the colors again against a whole background of art history. Uh, it's 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 a relatively straightforward task. I mean, if, if you take five art historians who are somewhat knowledgeable about uh, a period in Western art and show them five paintings, you know, th there's a reasonable chance that they're going to put them in order of quality. In each one is going to establish the same hierarchy. That's very different when you're looking at something that's completely non-representational. Um, there are still issues of composition and color and line, <clears throat> but they're they're somewhat more difficult to assess, especially when they're new. So even though Pollock had, uh, had such a terrific eye, and he was lucky enough to have Lee Krasner as his in-house editor and motivator, he wasn't really sure. When, you know, these things that look so inevitable to us, the minute he finished them, they didn't look inevitable. They were, um, uh, and, and in fact, Pollock himself was the one who would say to Lee Krasner, is this a painting? Not is it a good painting or a bad painting, but is it a painting? So if you grow up with everyone telling you that you have no real skill in the in your chosen profession, you know, you have your teachers at art school saying you can't draw, you 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 have this older brother who's the the, the art school's favorite student, and so you have a long history of lack of, of self confidence, and you're making an art form that is being appreciated by some key members of the art world, but not by everyone, even in the art world, and certainly not by the public at large. There is a there, uh, and you have the innate problems of self worth that come from having a father who doesn't think much of you, and having a mother who has to distribute her affection between five sons, and uh, who devotes much or most of it to the oldest son. It's, it was uh, it was a style of art that was not conducive to self uh, to to self worth. The most blatant example of this is the famous Thanksgiving that he had with several people, including the filmmaker and Hans Namuth. Hans had asked Pollock if he would be willing to participate in this in the making of a film about the making of a work of art, and he did two: one on the ground on canvas and one on a sheet of glass that was uh, off, uh, put, uh, set off the ground with sawhorses so that Hans could film it from underneath. And Hans, who was a rather Prussian uh, figure and a little bit bullying, basically directed Pollock as if he was an actor in a, in a scene in a film and would tell him, now paint more over there, paint over here, as a way of, of making the film work. I mean, he was doing it not... He wasn't uh, telling him what would be artistically successful. He was basically telling him what would make a better, uh, a better film. But Pollock is sitting there in a, after a period of relative sobriety, sitting there listening to um, Hans issue these orders about where he was supposed to paint and how long he was supposed to paint. And they go back in. It's quite a cold day to have their Thanksgiving dinner and, they get into a fight and uh, a verbal fight and Pollock uh, starts bickering with, uh, with Namuth about the issue of being a phony. And the famous line was, uh, I'm not a phony, you're a phony. Uh, I'm not a phony, you're a phony. It sort of reminds me of a certain figure in American politics right now. And uh, <laughs> uh, Pollock responds yeah. to this was to go back to go to the cabinet and pull out a bottle of whiskey and started drinking again heavily from that point um, forward for quite a while. So it um, 
yes, I, I, I think his fame, and there was a considerable amount of it, was never complete. Meaning that when when the famous Time magazine, or rather Life magazine article came out, which asked the rhetorical question, "Is Pollock the greatest living painter?" Um, or semi-rhetorical, the, uh, the, uh, the guy, the woman who wrote the article, was essentially indicating that she that he was, but the the the, the forces at Time Life were very conservative, and I think they really were not behind the uh, the notion that Pollock was the greatest living painter. And then a lot of the letters to the editor were of the kind that you mentioned before. You know, my child could paint like this. A chimpanzee could paint like this. So he never was able to sit back and enjoy fully the satisfaction of knowing that everyone, you know, this was not Picasso. He didn't have the world telling him he was a genius. He had individuals within the art world and a few collectors telling him as he was a genius, this sort of worldwide acclaim that is now out there, you know, Pollock didn't enjoy during his own lifetime. Um, I want to get into his death. One quick question. You mentioned uh, Picasso, and there's some indication that Pollock was influenced by Picasso. But I was, I was trying to look this up, and I couldn't really find anything. Did Picasso ever acknowledge him or – respond in kind and say, you know, I like your work too. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I don't think we have it in the book because it was, you know, after Pollock's lifetime, but, uh, um, or maybe, maybe I can't remember if it's in the book. I do. There was a, a rather amusing and rather profound, um, exchange between Picasso and Matisse. And it may have been the life magazine article. They saw some publication with some images of Pollock paintings. And interestingly, Picasso said, um, look at this ridiculous thing. <laughs> and uh, Matisse said, you know, not so wow. fast. When when we were first beginning, people questioned whether what we were doing uh, was legitimate. I'm obviously paraphrasing here and, and translating from the French. Um, so, you know, maybe there's more here than you and I are seeing. But that, that gives you some additional sense that even someone as innovative and radical and creative as Picasso didn't, it wasn't immediately able to see the quality of what was going on in Pollock's art because it was so radical and so different from what he himself had been doing. But there were people like Matisse who were willing to give it. I mean, Matisse, I don't think would have said that if it was, you know, obviously to him, amateurish, silly, pretension to art. I think he really, he wouldn't have said that if he didn't think there was something going on that he might not fully be able to appreciate, but which he could, could see might have something serious um, going on. Okay. And so uh, when it comes to the end of his life, um, Lee has gone to Europe and Jackson kind of has this mistress Ruth Kligman with him and she's kind of a sort of a trophy that he can show off but as you said it wasn't really any real intimacy uh, or at least physical intimacy there um, and he's drunk one night and goes on a, a drive to some party and um, with Ruth and her other friend and then it winds up with Jackson crashing the car dying and uh, not Ruth, but the other girl um, getting killed as well. Um, it's, it's hard to know exactly what was going through his mind or to describe it explicitly as a suicide, but the reckless aspect to it is, I, I think, suicidal at least. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, what happened at the end of his life? What sort of effect did that have on the people around him? Yes, um, I think you put it perfectly. The, the, the car crash was maybe not suicide, but it was certainly suicidal. The end of, at the end of Pollock's life, his, his, it's all coming apart. He's, just, uh, he's in a self-destructive, a very self-destructive moment. His behavior towards Lee and his lack of 
productivity and his um, drunkenness really finally uh, she finally gave up she uh, she still loved him and and was really uh, just destroyed by his death but before before the car crash and part of the reason for it um she finally got fed up with all those things and in particular with him flaunting of this young woman it was all too humiliating and infuriating and she decided to leave uh, and to go to Europe. I think part of it was hoping that this would shock him into getting rid of Ruth. So it was, it was a complex act on her part too, but um, uh, she leaves for Europe. He's got this, this uh, buxom young girl with him. And, uh, but and it was he was incredibly happy to be able to um, show her off and um, showed her off to de Kooning and showed her off to all the people on Long Island. It was but it was an incredibly uh, ham fisted and awkward thing because the last thing that all of Lee's friends <laughs> wanted to hear from Jackson was that he was seeing this young woman and uh, the reaction was not entirely positive. And he missed her. He just missed her terribly because he, the main uh, female companionship that he needed throughout his adult life was more maternal than romantic. And uh, all of a sudden, his mother, in the form of Lee Krasner, was had abandoned him. So he started drinking even more heavily. And unfortunately, Ruth, who didn't really want to spend the weekend with him alone, invited a friend from New York, a young girl named Edith Metzger, who was a concentration camp survivor to come spend the weekend with him, with them. And he had uh, Pollock had an invitation to go to a musical event at Alfonso Osorio's house. And Ruth, who wanted to both for herself and her friend to get out of the house, urged him to go, even though he had already started drinking. And on the way there, he stopped off at a bar and got even um, uh, more inebriated and on the way back, started driving very, very quickly. Edith starts screaming and asking him to stop and let her out. And he refuses. In fact, it just gets him. Uh, Rufus trying to get her to stop screaming because she knows it will just egg Pollock on. And there's a turn in the road and the road is slick. And uh, he plows into a tree and kills himself and this young concentration camp survivor. Uh, Ruth survives this crash but it you know certainly all this contributed to his mythology this this you know this is a very dramatic end to a life and um and i don't think you know it isn't i you know who knows what was going on in his head did he really intend to kill himself uh, it, it's hard to know it, it's certainly one of the things that makes him a less sympathetic figure than for example uh vincent van gogh um the um you know the clement greenberg who had been so crucial to his uh public relations the critic clement greenberg you know, refused to attend the funeral because he was so furious that pollock had taken uh edith uh, mesker with him when he died uh, it was uh the selfishness of that act is pretty extraordinary and it's um you know people wonder how we could spend 10 years with a figure of uh, like Pollock, who was so difficult. It's uh, it, it's certainly w the, the the main reason is that it's all of the challenges of his personality and of his life are redeemed by what he created, and he certainly could be charming. There were uh, Reuben Kadish's wonderful line is that he was a hard man to like, but an easy man to love. I mean that the needfulness, the intel, the sort of innate although inarticulate intelligence the staggering creativity and a certain amount of charm. He had a, 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 when he wanted it, a remarkable smile and he was quite good looking until he got uh, bloated from alcohol. There was, he, he could be appealing when he wasn't being mean and abusive. That's quite different in the case of Van Gogh, who was completely lacking in charm, but ultimately a sympathetic figure. And uh, it made, in some ways, living with Van Gogh for 10 years 
um, a, a happier time. Yeah, so let's let's talk about Van Gogh. Um, how easy was it for the two of you, uh, non-Dutch speaking Americans, to um, to sort of delve into and uh, research this guy's life? Who uh, obviously you didn't have the same advantage with uh, as you did with Pollock, where people were still alive who knew him. It was it was a huge challenge. You know, th- we took it on because having written Pollock, we wanted to do another. Uh, write another biography and it was made sense to write another biography of an artist and we really couldn't find an appropriate subject who was either American or English. Uh, we tried, you know, when there were artists we liked like Winslow Homer or John Singer Sargent, whom we would have perhaps wanted to spend 10 years with, but their lives simply weren't interesting enough. And um, we began to apply the same test I mentioned earlier for a suitable biographical subject to a range of artists. And um, we went into that knowing that the most interesting possible subject would be Van Gogh. And, um, but when you applied that test, it, it, um, Van Gogh was, became the, the obvious subject. Uh, first of all, he had led an incredibly interesting life. You know, we knew from the ear incident and, um, um, and the, just a, a limited awareness of the, um, of the sort of key details of his life, that it was a tragic and complicated one and interesting. You know, as with Van Gogh, the art was unbelievably important. In fact, one could argue that there is no artist who is more beloved in every country, among every age group, among every different level of knowledge about art history. And um, there was an adequate record, although unfortunately we wouldn't be able to interview people because he'd been dead so long. Um, but he left this almost unique body of letters, more than 700 letters, highly detailed, long letters that uh, revealed, in at least in part, uh, I mean, some of the letters are just asking for money from Theo. An astonishing number of sentences are devoted to asking Theo for more money. But a lot of them are, are these incredibly ele- you know, exquisite passages about his own art, about the art of the uh, painters he admired, about life and about death and about you know the both the both art and about the big topics, uh, the big subjects and about his relationships with the family members, uh, about his um, daily life. Uh, you know it was all there in these letters, and it turned out there was this, a comparable body of letters from the family members that would supplement this that wasn't as well known. And luckily, Theo, his younger brother was a pack rat and kept all these things. And, uh, but there was a, a fourth factor, which I didn't mention with respect to Pollock, although it was crucial there too. And that is, has this been done before? That's what really surprised us most with Pollock is it just didn't seem possible that a figure of his worldwide importance and a figure as beloved as he is, and if, and, and the uh, having left this massive body of letters, it just seemed impossible that no one had really attempted the big ambitious biography. But in fact, if you looked, uh, looked him up in the Encyclopedia Britannica, this is before the Wikipedia, days of Wikipedia, when the Encyclopedia Britannica was still the sort of dominant uh, entity of this kind. Um, in the bibliography, it right. began by saying there is no definitive biography of Vincent Van Gogh. So it was, uh, that was really the, the, the final reason for undertaking this, huge project. We, we really didn't know going into it just how vast it would be. Uh, we, we decided, and as I'm sure others have, that writing a great big book is sort of like childbirth. You fortunately forget just how difficult it is or you wouldn't have the next, next child. And we did with, with, with Van Gogh, it turned out to be even more demanding in part because as you mentioned, we don't speak Dutch and, uh, even though Van Gogh spoke four languages, including English uh, and French and German, as well as his native tongue of Dutch, the letters were in Dutch. And we knew there would be some, even though there was this translation from his sister and another more formal translation underway, it would have been wonderful to read them in the original language. There is something, something is lost in translation. And, uh, but more importantly, there were all these other, sources that weren't translated. The family letters had never been translated, 
except we kept a couple of lines here, there, and there. Um, and all the secondary literature was, uh, fortunately, there weren't too many books in Dutch that were crucial to him, although there were some. Um, and we actually had some of those translated for us. But there was all the literature about his the, the, the times he lived in um, that we needed to, 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 to read. And because Holland is such a small country, most of that secondary literature is not translated into English. You know, most of the great books on France or Germany have been translated because the countries are so big and, and important and there's so many people who are interested in them. Holland's a very small country. So that, for example, the books on, on, on Dutch family life in the 19th century, those were in Dutch but not in English. The books on prostitution in, in, um, in, in Holland, you know, the, the books on prostitution in France were available in English, but not the ones on prostitution in Holland. Um, uh, uh, the historical accounts, some of the best histories uh, of Holland during the period when Van Gogh was um, growing up there were not available in English. So we had to assemble a, a translation team and um, we had 11 translators. We also had seven researchers and two software engineers. It really took a, a large village to write this book. And wow. we had one translator luckily here in the small town in South Carolina where we live who was Dutch. And I would sit with him. I remember when we were, Greg and I were in law school, there was a girl there who was blind. And I thought, my gosh, this being a law student is hard enough, but trying to do your homework when you can't see. And what she had to do is she had a reader and who would basically read topic sentences for her and then would read to her. She, you know, she would go through the table of contents and and try to figure out what sections she had to read, then ask for topic sentences, and he would read them to her, and then he would, she would sort of figure out what she had to absorb in order to complete the lesson or the paper or the test or whatever. And um, we really had to do the same thing with this gentleman. I would have to go through these huge amounts of material and ask him to help me figure out what might be relevant, and then we would keep notes and we would send the, 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 the passages and in some cases chapters and even in some cases entire books off to one of these 10 other translators to, to send back in English. And um, it, was a, it was a demanding task, especially because in addition to all those Dutch sources, there was so much other material. I mean, it doesn't compare to what a presidential biographer has to face. I mean, I, uh, Caro talks about going to the Johnson Library at the University of Texas and seeing this vast building filled with paper, <laughs> um, all of which he had to have at least some awareness of. You know, you don't, yeah. get, you don't have that even with a figure like Van Gogh. But because we wanted to, we wanted to get inside his head, we not only had to have the, the letters and the secondary sources, we also had to read the books that he himself read, um, and he read voluminously. So I spent about three years trying to read everything he read to try to understand what his world, what informed his worldview. That, that I think that gives you a sense of of what went into this book. Yeah. So let's try and get inside his head right now. Um, when it comes to his childhood, um, he was. Apparently, there was a, another child that came before him that was going to be named Vincent, who died in stillbirth. And there's sort of a um, a replacement child syndrome that um, you guys have talked about in the past, um, and that may have affected his mother's behavior towards him. Um, and then, as for his father, who was a pastor in this uh, sort of Protestant enclave, and surrounded by a Catholic. Ski Catholic see as you described it um, what what styles of parenting did they have and um, how did that you think affect the young Vincent well I think it w was again you know, Greg and I really think that the childhood is in the uh, in the cliche the child is father to the man and we think that's true of all of us I mean I don't 
I would think anyone listening to this can go through not only the members of their own family, not only in their through their own life, but through the lives of the people they know well. And it's hard not to connect certain aspects of all of our personalities to either some <clears throat> mirroring of a parental behavior or some rebellion against that parental behavior. And um, not to mention all the sibling issues where there are siblings. And that was certainly true of Van Gogh. The, the, the father was, as you say so nicely, in this uh, Protestant enclave in a sea of Catholics. Um, but the mother, in marrying him, she was quite old when she married him. She only got married because the last of her sisters was ready to get married. And a, a younger sister was marrying a, a man named Van Gogh, who was a wealthy art dealer. And he, the, the Van, that Van Gogh had this um, younger brother, Doris, and the woman he was marrying had this older sister, Anna, and they decided to put them together. And so these two sisters married these two brothers. But but uh, the art dealer was incredibly wealthy, lived in a, ma a massive mansion in uh, Breda and... Um, uh, with a huge art collection and lots of servants and and travel to luxurious spots to spend the winter. And, uh, and Anna marries this rather poor pastor, and she leaves their childhood home of uh, The Hague, which was a princely city and, and a very beautiful and um, rather wealthy city to go to this little town of Zundert, and um, in understanding what that move must have meant for Anna and did mean for her, you, it's important to understand what was going on in Dutch history and Dutch culture. And that is that the country had been riven by religious warfare for centuries. There, it was, you know, it was, the country was in constant turbulence. And when those religious wars died down, the, the middle class, especially of Holland, became incredibly fearful of, of, um, of life and of its difficulty and wanted as much stability and, uh, as possible. And the middle class became incredibly conservative and resistance to change and resistance to any lack of conformity with the sort of social norms. This was magnified for Anna because she left uh, upper middle class life in The Hague to live a very middle class, lower middle class life in this outpost. And so conforming, conformity to bourgeois norms became incredibly important to her. It was crucial in her mind that, that she and her husband and all of their children behave properly, dress properly, socialize properly. I say these things, but um, because you've read the book, you know that she, these were not just, you know, attributes of a successful life. They were crucial in her mind to a successful life. And all of a sudden, they're, they're, well, they have this one child who is named Vincent, who dies in and is stillborn. And uh, exactly a year later, uh, our Vincent is born. They name him, give him the same name. To the extent that the replacement child syndrome had an effect, we think it was not Vincent worrying about whether he lived up to the the pre previous child. It was Vincent seeing his mother wonder if he lived up to the to the what what the earlier child might have become. And our Vincent is this incredibly rebellious, difficult child who violates all of the norms that were so important to his mother, Anna. You know, he refuses to stay well-dressed. Uh, he, he's constantly going out and into the fields and into the countryside and getting filthy. He skips school, plays hooky constantly. He refuses to behave properly among their, their, their social contacts. He's everything that Anna feared, and it never got better. To his dying day, he, he refused to become the dutiful, successful, polite, well-behaved person that Anna wanted him to be. So he grows up in the constant knowledge that he was uh, disappointing both of his parents. 
and he gets um, he gets sent off to work <clears throat> at that um, for his uncle, the very successful art dealer, with the expectation that, assuming he does well, he could potentially inherit the entire or a big part of this massive art uh, dealership empire. Um, but he kept on getting uh, demoted, basically, and then eventually fired. Um, it's kind of hard to understand how this guy, who was one of the greatest of our artists of all time, obviously knew a lot about art, had a great eye. Um, why couldn't he keep a job in the art world? Well, uh, he really couldn't make any relationships, whether professional or personal. Um, he was argumentative. He was um, awkward. He was, uh, he had a, he lacked any form of social poise. He was difficult to be around. He couldn't keep any friends. The only romantic relationship he's, he, he had were with women he paid by the encounter. He had a year-long relationship with Seen Hornick, a prostitute in The Hague, but he paid her by the day. He had several friends, but he couldn't keep them. So you put him in a, in a work environment, and he could handle the things that didn't require any interaction, meaning that he could handle the sort of you know, he handled the, the wrapping and mailing of works of art. He could do that. He could be a, a, a sort of a petty bureaucrat. But if you put him in contact with anyone, whether his bosses or the customers, he messed it up. There's a very f amusing incident in Paris in the gallery where t uh, two women come up to him and ask him questions about something they're looking at. And he tells them what bad taste they have to be looking at this work and that they really need to be looking at this other much better painting over here. And, the, you know, they, they understandably um, are infuriated by this insulting behavior and walk out of the gallery. Well, you can imagine being his boss and thinking this is going to be the, you do not want this guy around a potential sale. Right. And uh, as you say, he went into the gallery because his uncle Vincent had no, children and because he was uh, uncle vincent was close to doris the pastor and because vincent was not only the namesake but also the eldest son of the pastor it was assumed that when vincent went off to the hague to work in the family gallery at age 15 that he would eventually um, run it and own it but instead he uh, is immediately uh, performing terribly and is then sent away to the, uh, um, the 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 London office with a demotion. Then that doesn't work out, so he's sent to Paris with a demotion. And in Paris, he's fired, and not only fired, but banished from ever stepping foot in the family gallery again. So, uh, and this is made even worse by the fact that his younger brother Theo then goes into the family business and rises quite quickly through it because Theo had all of the charm and all of the interpersonal skills that Vincent lacked. Um, so I think that gives you the beginning of a sense of what Van Gogh's adult life is going to be like. Right. So after that experience in the art world, um, he teaches for a little while, but he really wants to become a, a pastor like his father. Um, what was that process like for him? And then when he finally wound up, uh, when he did finally wind up preaching in the, the coal country, how did that work out for him? Was he well received? Well, it, um, to be a minister in the, in the Dutch church in the 19th century, a lot of education, you had to have what was the equivalent of a PhD and you had to know Greek and Latin. And, uh, it was a very, uh, arduous process, academic process. So when he, develops this ambition to become a, um, a pastor like his father, having failed to become an art dealer like his uncle. Uh, he goes to the Amsterdam, lives with his uncle, who's basically the, another uncle who is the admiral of the Dutch Navy. It was, a, it was, you know, it was a prominent family, but he has this teacher who's coaching him in these various subjects. And he just can't stay disciplined enough despite his, extraordinary intelligence, almost genius level uh, IQ, 
he couldn't force himself to study. I mean, we all, I mean, uh, it's, he's hardly the only one. We know that Einstein, you know, flunked third grade math, although I'm told that might be a uh, apocryphal, but it, it does suggest that, uh, you know, that not all, there are people who are almost bored by academics because they're so smart. And there are also people who are just too undisciplined to study what they have to study as opposed to what they want to study. And Van Gogh, after a, a while, was doing so badly in the Amsterdam, it was costing the family so money that they just gave up on it, at which point he decided he wanted to become a missionary because that required less academic training. And he couldn't make a go of that. He became a missionary briefly in the coal mining country. But because he he failed to live up to the standards of, the, of his uh, bosses, he... Um, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine how badly he behaved. He went to this poor village and he was so manic and, and to be honest, crazy that he decided that he could only minister to these impoverished people if he lived more, uh, was as poor as they were. So he started giving away his clothing. He left the, the farm house that he was living in to, to move into an unheated shed and slept on a board and it, at some point started cu uh, cudgeling himself with a rod to be basically, you know, as an act of penance, beat himself. He didn't bathe. And these proper Dutch bosses uh, from the nearby town come and visit and they, they order him to improve his behavior, you know, move back into the house, dress properly, take a bath once in a while. And he refuses to do all that. So they eventually fire him. And so he keeps on, he goes further down the ladder and becomes what's called a cold porter, which just involved handing out free Bibles to poor people. And he couldn't even do that adequately. So having failed so astonishingly in the field of, of art, of an art gallery, he becomes, um, he fails utterly at every conceivable level uh, as a, um, as a minister, as a missionary, as a coal porter. And he's basically at this point left with nothing. Um, and that's when Pio in this, without really knowing what, what he was doing and how, what the, what importance it would have not only for Vincent, but for art history and for world civilization, sends him some self-help books on drawing and some paper and some pencils. And all of a sudden, this new career begins. Yeah. So that's one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit, his resilience. When we talk about the difference between him and Pollock, I feel like there's kind of a sort of a, there's like a quote that Van Gogh, while he was in the midst of all this, you know, cuddling himself and so on, eating potato scraps. And uh, he says, uh, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Clearly he's, you know, he's going through a hard time, but he kind of, has this sort of forward momentum at every step um, or is able to regain that forward momentum. When he took up art, did he immediately decide that this is going to be my new career um, or what sort of led to that decision? No, he, um, I don't think he had any idea and certainly Theo didn't that this would am am amount to anything. In Theo's mind, and perhaps in Vincent's, it was just something to keep him occupied, you know, feeling in the only way to keep him from being self-destructive was to keep him busy. But because he'd been in the art world, you know, he, he, he had seen in the gallery some of Holland's most successful artists. He had a cousin named Anton Moe, a cousin by marriage, who was one of the country's most successful artists. And as you say, he was unbelievably resilient. Most people having failed so utterly in two careers would have just completely collapsed um, emotionally at this point. And Vincent keeps on going. I mean, one of the things that makes him so attractive, despite all of the unattractive aspects of his life, was this unbelievable resilience in the face of adversity. I mean, I think one of the reasons why we, uh, we've, uh, and by we, I mean everyone who knows him and sees his art, are, are, is so affected by him is that we know, even if we haven't read the, a full biography, simply from the ear incident, the fact that he cut his ear off, that obviously this was a difficult life. 
and yet he kept on working and he was one of the most productive artists in in art history he began late but uh, in the last 70 days of his life he painted a painting every day these these astonishing masterpieces were painted his entire career was only 10 years the serious a, a mature work was mostly done in the last four years of his life. And the great masterpieces were mostly done in the last two years of his life. And uh, uh, you used a, a key phrase, a key phrase for us in understanding him and a key phrase for him was the biblical phrase, sorrowful, but always rejoicing. You know, he kept repeating that man mantra to himself. Um, and it meant that no matter how difficult and miserable his life was, he could take joy in it. Um, and in some ways, I think it, it summarizes the art too. I mean, one of the reasons that I think the art affects us so much, isn't just that it's so extraordinarily beautiful and innovative, but that it's so joyful. I mean, if you think about not just the flower paintings, but the, uh, the gorgeous landscapes, there's such joyful images, joyful in the, in the subject matter, joyful in the, um, in the in the incredibly um, vigorous and yet playful um, brushwork in the incredibly bright and brilliant uh, palette, the, the color, they are, the, 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 and yet there isn't often a, a slight tinge of sadness to them. They are they are a representation of his life. I mean, this is a an, a good example where biography and um, the biography of a person and what it is that they accomplish does connect and explains why biography is so powerful as a mechanism for understanding uh, accomplishment. The art is the ultimate example of, of joy uh, emerging from sorrow. And uh, I think that when you walk through an exhibition of Van Gogh's work, there's a kind of silent reverie. And I think one of the reasons for that is that the people there know he had this short, difficult life, and yet he's filling his life and ours with these incredibly beautiful and joyful images. Yeah, and he had that sort of early beginning. You mentioned it was a very short career, and uh, what you identify as kind of the pivot point in that career um, was his moving to Paris with his brother, Theo. Uh, he got to come into contact with a lot of impressionists and contemporary artists who he had in the past sort of dismissed or wasn't as interested in. Um, what kind of work was he doing up to that point and what effect did that experience in Paris have on his artistic career? Um, it was transformative. and um, But let me back up and say that even though there are these pivot points, there is also a through line, meaning that uh, uh, before he arrived in in Paris, he had already painted the Bible, right. which is a work of just staggering beauty. And there were certainly others. There were drawings done in Noonan. The Pollard Birches is an example, which may be his most beautiful drawing ever. So there were works that um, were of incredibly high level of achievement, but you know, if he hadn't moved to Paris, I don't know that we would, and, and had not accomplished the next four years' work, I don't know that we would have given him enough attention to even see how glorious some of those early works were. But when he comes to Paris, the big change is that he changes his palette completely. Um, ironically, before he really knew what Impressionism was, but knew that it uh, involved using brighter colors and limiting darker colors, uh, he was offended by it because uh, having come out of both English black and white illustration and a certain kind of dark interior, the dark interior scenes of Dutch artists like Joseph Israels um, and having tried to paint like that in especially the very famous painting, the potato eaters, you know, he had set himself to painting as dark an image as he possibly could and argued about how colorful these very dark paintings were by indicating that some of the of the dark colors had a reddish tone and some had a bluish tone. <laughs> and as Greg so brilliantly says in the, in the biography, he sort of argued himself into an artistic style long before he got there because he comes to Paris 
and he sees the impression, the work of the impressionist, and sees how highly colored it is, he finally agrees with Theo that he should open up his palette. And then all of the sort of lessons about color that he had implemented so awkwardly in the dark paintings in Noonan, he begins to paint incredibly brightly in Paris. And when he moves to Arles two years later, the, the colors take on an even uh, more intense uh, hue. Why did he leave Paris? Well, that is one of the sort of interesting story or, or challenges of understanding his life is, you know, why would he do this? He had he was so lonely. He had spent so many years wanting to move to uh, to live with with Theo or wanted Theo to leave Paris and his uh, career as an art dealer to come live with Vincent, that it is hard to to understand why having achieved this goal this lifelong goal of living with his younger brother, um, he finally just almost without indication to his brother, just picks up, packs up and leaves. There are many explanations that have been offered over the years and Vincent himself offered some of them. Uh, he goes to Arles in, in Provence. And for example, the women of Arles were well known in, or it was believed in Paris and elsewhere that the women of Arles were particularly beautiful that they had these wonderful Greek profiles from their heritage in the South um, and their proximity to, to Italy and, um, and Greece. And um, they, they basically, they thought of them as having these perfect classical faces and um, they being the people of France in that era. And um, uh, Vincent also claimed that the cold of Paris was difficult for him given his health difficulties and therefore moving to the South would, um, would be good for his health. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there were other artists who went South, at least occasionally during the year. Um, Monet famously to Antibes, Cezanne to his hometown in Aix-en-Provence, which is not that far from Arles. Um, so there are all these different reasons. But it, Greg and I believed that the principal reason was that Theo, like Vincent, was going through terribly difficult health problems. Uh, both of them had syphilis and Theo's, the syphilis was more advanced than Vincent's even. And this brought on a whole host of terrible medical afflictions. And Vincent was aware, partly because Theo told him that living with Theo was not great for Theo's health. I mean, he was so argumentative and so um, difficult that it was one more challenge in an already challenging life. I mean, Theo, like most uh, sort of office workers, shop workers in, in 19th century Europe, worked six days a week, um, you know, 10 or 12 hours a day. You know, you know the, the conveniences that we all assume in our daily lives weren't there. Uh, he did have, you know, there was, there was no... Um, you know, the, the modern conveniences were simply not there. Uh, they had a, a, a girl who helped clean the apartment and helped with the cooking, but still it wasn't easy. And on top of this, he's feeling uh, tired and um, just going through one medical problem after another. And Vincent, we think, decided that the last thing Theo needed was more of Vincent. And it was therefore, in our opinion, and there are indications of this in in Van Gogh's letters. Um, you know, none of this comes just out of our thinking. There was a, uh, I, I think it was just an enormous act of generosity. It was, you know, the, he, right. having wanted to live with Theo for most of his adult life, he leaves and he does it for Theo. Uh, again, we talked about Pollock and how, uh, Actually, actually, we didn't talk about just quite how mean he could be. I mean, to Lee Krasner, he he stopped her from painting because he didn't want the, the uh, uh, basically stopped her from painting because he didn't want the competition. He wanted her complete total attention. He was certainly verbally abusive to her and uh, was also occasionally physically abusive. Um, he wasn't a nice guy. And it doesn't, you know, that's it's a myth to think that people who achieve great things 
even in the arch, necessarily need to be nice people. I mean, Beethoven wasn't a nice guy. Um, we've recently been reading ju just uh, about Einstein at the very time that his general theory of relativity is being proved more and more accurate, not just in our galaxy, but now in other galaxies as well. But we're also reading about how, uh, what a racist he was, um, especially with regards to certain Asian Asians and uh, um, it's right. so the fact that Pollock wasn't a nice guy doesn't in any way um, diminish the the greatness of what he accomplished as a painter or the joy that those paintings give us. But I must say, as a biographer, it was a lot easier to live in Vincent's um, uh, crazy head for 10 years than to live in Pollock's. And, and in part, it was because there was a basic sweetness and um, and uh, generosity that ran through Vincent's life that didn't run through Pollock's. Um, and, and leaving Paris in order to safeguard Theo's health is perhaps one of the most important examples. Yeah, and so he leaves Paris and he goes to the Yellow House, um, where he lived with Paul Gauguin for a period of time, um, and originally uh, worked himself up into envisioning this house as sort of a, an artist's commune, uh, but it wound up just being him and Paul, and even that, it was only for a brief period of time. How did he manage to wrangle to get uh, wrangle Paul Gauguin over there, and what was their relationship like while they lived together? I mentioned earlier that the only uh, romantic relationships that Van Gogh had were paid for by the day. Well, in a sense, his his friendship with Gauguin was paid for by the day too. Gauguin had had a, a couple of successful um, sales, but he was still struggling financially terribly. And Theo was his dealer, and Vincent concocted this scheme in which Theo would pay would give Gauguin a stipend uh, in exchange for his work just as he was giving Vincent a stipend for his work. The difference being that Theo was in a position to sell some of Van Gauguin's work and had not yet sold much in the way of anything of Van Gogh's. One painting at some point was sold, but nothing else. Whereas Gauguin made uh, some of the paintings, both in Martinique and from Brittany, had sold, but he still was eventually... Succumb, he eventually Gauguin eventually succumbed to the to the financial offer that uh, Theo proposed, which was that he moved to Arles, live with Vincent, share their expenses, and that in exchange uh, Theo would give him 150 francs a month plus the proceeds from the sales. And um, so Gauguin comes, arrives, rather skeptical about the whole thing, and the minute he meets uh, Van Gogh or is with him. He is convinced this is a terrible idea, that this no one could live with this person for long. He immediately tells his friends back in Paris that, you know, he's going to have to uh, move back any day. He stays for a couple of months, um, but uh, it's a difficult time and did almost leave a couple of times during that period. Uh, Vincent, on the one hand, you know, as with everyone else, combines this terrible, uh, these two conflicting uh, personality attributes. On the one hand, he he um, he was uh, he engaged in a in a, in a interpersonal uh, process that psychiatrists called adhesiveness, meaning that when he was with somebody, he just stuck to him. He um, he wouldn't let him out of his sight. He wanted to be with him all day long, every day. But he also was incredibly argumentative. And everything became the pretext or the a trigger for a, an argument. And the combination of never having any time to himself and this constant argumentation was really impossible to sustain. And eventually, Gauguin decided that he just had to leave and finally did around Christmas. 
And what was uh, Vincent's reaction to that? Well, at first he he was so desirous, he was so lonely, and and saw Gauguin as a Theo substitute, um, and so he tried to make he tried to keep Gauguin there. Uh, one of the techniques was one of the things they fought about was the nature of painting. Van Gogh painted uh, from nature and painted quickly and painted with with a with a, with a lot of impasto, a lot of thick paint. Gauguin painted just the opposite. He painted from the head. Detet was the f- French phrase. He sort of imagined a, scene, a, a fictional scene and then painted it sometimes based on drawings for incidents within the scene, but the overall composition was an imaginative one. He painted very slowly and carefully with these small hatch marks um, or uh, hatch strokes, and he painted very thinly. It was a very cerebral, if beautiful, work, but completely different from Vincent's. And Vincent, in order to keep Gauguin happy, not only treated him like what what he called the master of their of their order of their monastic like order but also told Gauguin over and over again what a better artist he was flattered him as much as he could and ultimately flattered him by trying to paint like Gauguin and painted at least three paintings in Gauguin's detet style but he couldn't do it it was just not natural to him the paintings are not successful and he finally even while Gauguin was there reverted to his own much more important style and in retrospect despite the fact that Van Gogh tried to paint like Gauguin uh, if we look at the at the, their bodies of work in the end Gauguin was far more influenced by Vincent than Vincent was by Gauguin um, but eventually as I mentioned Gauguin decides he can't take it anymore and tells Vincent that he's going to leave. And then when he left, um, sort of in the immediate aftermath, there's the probably the most famous episode from his life where he cuts off his ear and delivers it to a prostitute. Obviously, he was in a state of delirium, psychosis. But what what was happening there? Besides Gauguin leaving, what sort of stressors led to that moment? And was there any logic behind what he was doing? Well, there were, there were sort of um, reasons why he might have thought of cutting off his ear. Uh, and these have been mentioned in the literature often. Um, there were examples both in the Bible and in a novel by Emile Zola, the French novelist, of somebody cutting off an ear. And, uh, of course, Toreador's or Matador's um, cut off a bull's ear at the end of a bullfight. So there were incidents that Vincent drew upon in his psychotic state. Uh, he also was hearing voices and, uh, you know, cutting off the ear might have been uh, a, a, a crazy uh, way of, of, of silencing those voices. But... Um, uh, it, it's also a form of, of self-mutilation, clearly. You know, the whole uh, cutting of any kind can be used to displace the, the pain of existence and the misery of daily life and the uh, sense of hopelessness with the more immediate displacing pain of, 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 physical, of a physical injury. And so one wonders if it wasn't all of that and a way of sort of shaming Gauguin of saying, basically, this is how, this is the kind of damage you're going to do to me by leaving. And this is how terrible it is. You know, here's my ear because the, it's pretty clear to us that the, in giving the, uh, the, 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 the removed portion of the ear to the prostitute, he was really giving it to, to Gauguin's prostitute to give to him. So it was really an offering, not so much to the prostitute as it was ultimately to Gauguin. But of course, this only confirmed Gauguin's feeling that he couldn't possibly have lived with, <laughs> with Van Gogh. Right. Um, and then after that, uh, he does go to an asylum and he gets treated by this doctor, uh, Felix Ray, who's 
roommate during medical school published a thesis on temporal lobe epilepsy. And that's what apparently Vincent got treated for and actually received some medication for. Was that successful for him at all? Um, and what was his life like emotionally, artistically at the asylum? Well, there were two asylums. There was sort of a psychiatric wing of the local hospital, which is where he went in the immediate aftermath of the ear incident, both to recover from that injury, which involved a lot of blood loss, but also to be observed for the obvious psychiatric problems that led him to, to mutilate himself in this way. That was terrible because they, one, he was in the psychotic mess. Two, they eventually put him in solitary confinement and manacled him to the bed. And it was just one of the low points of his life. They gave him some paper and pencil at one point, but he looked like he might injure himself further, so they removed that. He eventually recovered and went back to the yellow house, but living there became impossible. And um, so he moved in with Ray's mother for a while, but he eventually succumbed to the arguments that he needed to be in a disciplined medical facility and he admitted himself into the hospital in San Remi, which was, uh, you know, a ride from uh, a cart ride from, from Arl. And he spent quite a few months in San Remi. That by contrast, well, actually when he first got there, interestingly, he was quite happy because there were so many inmates uh, and they were all crazier than, as, as Vincent said, crazier than he was. You know, they didn't look down on him. First of all, he, for the first time, he was surrounded by people who um, uh, that made him look normal, and he was surrounded by people, so he wasn't lonely. For uh, but eventually, he realized that they may have provided some form of company, but they were so crazy it wasn't a, really a, 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 a fulfilling or gratifying foreign company, and he began to sort of distance himself from the other patients. But except for a few psychotic episodes, the people who administered the San Remi facility and asylum um, gave Vincent the opportunity to paint. They gave him a room on the first floor where he could keep his, his supplies. Uh, when he wanted to leave the asylum, they would uh, arrange for someone to accompany him. And he painted some of his great masterpieces during those months and in, in many of them. Uh, of his masterpieces in those months in San Remi, including famously Starry Night, but also some of the great flower paintings, the roses and the irises. Um, he'd already done the sunflowers in Arl, but the roses and irises are even more joyful. But we, we talked about the crucial phrase, sorrowful, but always rejoicing. Well, there he is in this, t in this sort of lower to middle class asylum in, the, in southern France with no family nearby. Vin uh, Theo didn't visit once, nor did his mother or anybody else from the family. Despite this, and, and undergo, undergoing a number of psychiatric episodes, paints some of his, not only his, some of his best paintings, but some of his most joyful paintings. Those flower paintings, it's hard to imagine anything more joyful than the roses or the irises. And uh, uh, it, it's a, yet another example of his resilience and his deep desire to pull some sort of joy out of, out of sorrow, out of misery. And... Um, one of the reasons we love him is that he was able to accomplish this extraordinary feat, creating some of the great masterpieces of Western civilization in these terribly bad circumstances. Um, the, you mentioned that Ray's roommate in, at, at the medical school, which was in Montpellier, had done a, a dissertation on temporal lobe epilepsy. It, it turned out that quite a few members of both of Van Gogh's family, both on the father's side and the mother's side, had epilepsy. Epilepsy is, to some extent, uh, uh, um, genetic, or it can be. So when he was admitted at San Remi, the doctor listed epilepsy as the diagnosis. Um, we assume, since he didn't have grand mal seizures, that he must have meant the kind of temporal lobe epilepsy that Ray's roommate had written about. Um, there is some disagreement as to what Vincent's psychiatric problems were. And it's clear that they, he had many. 
I mean, it, w one reason it's hard to diagnose him is that there were so many um, comorbidities, um, mental ones. <clears throat> he certainly was manic depressive. You know, the alcoholism was a problem. Uh, there was uh, um, the absent that he drank in, uh, had a substance called wormwood, which was of, um, uh, meant that he also had a drug problem of sorts. The, the syphilis was bad enough, but the mercury that they gave him to medicate the syphilis also produced both physical and mental problems. And um, on top of all this, Greg and I believe, although it's not completely uh, universally believed, that he had temporal lobe epilepsy, which is a terribly difficult disease. A lot of famous people had it, including um, uh, St. Paul and uh, Muhammad and um, um, Napoleon and uh, Flaubert. I mean, there's a long list. In, in, the, in the disease, well, first of all, a lot of very creative and important people had it, which is interesting in and of itself. But um, um, the, the, the disease creates these episodes in which you completely blank out basically and lose your, 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 your cognition. And, uh, and you sort of feel the episode coming on. So there's this terribly frightening period when you know that you're going to lose yourself. Then you go through this period and you don't even know what you're doing during it. And, and you can harm yourself as Vincent did a couple of times. He drank some turpentine during one of these episodes. Um, and then you have this terrible feeling of lassitude and exhaustion when you come out of it. And unfortunately, each one of these episodes makes the next one more likely. So Vincent was terrified. It was, it was very frightening. And he was frightened that that the disease would only get worse and that this would consume more and more of his life. But in between episodes, in between these temporal lobe epileptic episodes, you know, one can lead a relatively normal life. So he wasn't, he didn't have the ongoing psychosis that so many of the other patients at San Remy had. And the sort of intermittent na nature of these episodes permitted him to accomplish these great paintings that he painted while he was at the asylum. Um, you mentioned how he painted Starry Night there, and I think he said in a letter to his brother um, uh, that's mentioned in your book, like, you know, oh, th throw it away if you don't like it or something like that, and, you know, ah, it didn't come off. He was very self-effacing in that way. What I wanted to ask you is um, when you talk about, like, Pollock, there's clearly an ambition there to be like a great renowned artist. Um, and yet when Van Gogh actually did have a critic sort of praise his work, he went out of his way to write to this critic and say, you know, oh, Gauguin is actually a lot better than me. And you know, I'm not who you're looking for. Did, did Van Gogh have that kind of ambition? Um, or what was he trying to get out of his art? Well, it's, it, it's complex because um, on the one hand, he had justified his failure by arguing that people who succeed have it even worse than people who fail. So that when there were, were the first stirrings of success towards the end of his life, including this remarkable article from a critic in, in Paris in the first episode of a, of a symbolist journal, you know, calls Van Gogh the greatest living artist. Um, his immediate reaction, in addition to the self-effacing one, that that um, that Gauguin was the great Gauguin was the great artist, not Vincent himself. The other, there was also a fear that set in that my God, if if life has been as bad as it's already been as a failure, my God, can I handle any success whatsoever? So on the one hand, he writes this letter to Albert Aurier saying, "No, you've got this all wrong." Gauguin's the great master. I'm merely an acolyte. Um, but there's also some pride. I mean, he asked Theo to send copies of the journal to members of his family and to some of the key artists around Paris. So it was uh, a feeling of ambivalence, really. And one does wonder how he would have acclimated to success if it had lasted longer. I mean, this article comes out, I think it was in January of 1890, and Van Gogh dies in July. So there isn't that much time for this 
celebrity or this fame to um, develop, there was another important episode, and that was that Theo, on his behalf, submitted, I think it was six paintings to an important exhibition in Brussels. The reaction there was really interesting. A couple of major painting, painters, including the Belgian painter uh, Theo van Rijsselberg, uh, said how interesting Van Gogh's work was. But even Claude Monet, who had some paintings in the exhibition and who went to see it, said that he thought the most interesting work there was the work of this um, young Dutch painter. So uh, the point there is that both in the article and in the exhibition, the world was beginning to take notice before Van Gogh died at such a young age uh, a, a few months later. And even though he reacted both with a little bit of pride and with a lot of fear and a, a considerable humility to the uh, to this for these first blushes of, of success, we don't know how he would have handled the success if it became more uh, became more clear and um, and more all embracing. So he dies in 1890, um, and this was a sort of a I guess controversial aspect of your book. Could you tell us? the basically what is originally has been presented to us about the series of events that led to his death and what is your case for your version of events that led to his death well the the famous um suicide made famous uh, particularly in Irving Stone's fictionalized biography, Lust for Life, which came out in the 1930s and was reprised and reached a much larger audience yet in the uh, Kirk Douglas movie of 1956, I believe it was, Lust for Life. Uh, Van Gogh uh, goes out to the wheat fields and paints his last painting and pulls out a gun and shoots himself. It doesn't work any climbs down the escarpment to his room at the Rabu Inn, climbs upstairs, Theo is summoned, and he dies in Theo's arms. We, early on, saw some problems with this story. First of all, the principal uh, source of the material was the daughter of the innkeeper, Adeline Rabu, and her story kept changing mm -hmm. over time and got more and more detailed and more and more emphatic. Um, there was no uh, medical, uh, there was no autopsy, so we don't really have a complete medical picture of what happened. But there were some oddities. Uh, one was, why? who would give Van Gogh a gun? They weren't common in rural France at the time. Everybody in town knew that he'd been in, in an insane asylum. This is Auvers in north of Paris, where he spent his last months um, after having leaving after leaving the insane asylum, uh, why why would someone give him a gun and why would he have the gun? Uh, it was said to scare away birds, but we know from his childhood that he loved birds. We also know that the painting Crows in the Wheat Field was not his last painting. And, um, you know, even though it can be seen as a meditation on death and in combination with the other elements of the suicide story makes for a very sort of cinematic conclusion to his life, but first of all, it turns out there were no cr crows at that time in that season in um, in our Elver. Vincent wouldn't have wanted to scare them away with a gun anyway, as as he does in Lust for Life, um, because he loved birds. And birds were often added to a um, a painting as as a pictorial incident. And clearly, that's what he did in the Crows in the Wheat Field. Plus, it was painted several weeks before he died. And the last images were not meditations on death. They were incredibly buoyant, lovely paintings like the great blue landscape that uh, was painted just before he died. And Daubigny's garden, this wonderfully lush, flower-filled uh, landscape that he did of the home of the French Barbizon painter Daubigny, who lived near, who's, who had a house near the Ravu Inn. So the last paintings were were hopeful and and. But so was the last letter to uh, Theo, which, among other things, requested additional supplies of paint. You know, why would he be wanting more paint 
as he's contemplating dying. And more importantly, why would he go out in the morning of the, of the death to paint, taking all of his painting equipment with him, come home for, um, and then you know, come home without bringing the, the paint equipment with him. It just didn't seem like the, the set of events that would lead up to shooting himself. Um, also, if he did shoot himself, it was, it was at such an odd angle. It was sort of in the, in the stomach, not in the heart or in the mouth or the head. And it's an incredibly painful way to, to die. And so the question is, when it didn't work, when he didn't die instantly, why didn't he shoot himself again? Um, and where, what happened to the gun? What happened to the painting equipment? All these were questions. But then we began to see a few um, things in the literature, documents in the literature that proposed ultimately a different possible account of the death. And that is, it began with an, an, an interview with a man named Rene Secretin, who was a banker, who as a, as a young boy at age 16 had been living in Aubert with his brother Gaston, who was two years older, or maybe they were 15 and 17. It was either that or 16 and 18. And um, <clears throat> they mentioned that uh, a number of things, one of them being that they knew Vincent during that summer, that um, they bullied him terribly. They put salt in his coffee and a snake in his uh, paint box they would get him drunk. They would take him to a, a bar nearby and and get him drunk and get drunk themselves while they were at it. Um, and Rene mentions in this late interview, his brother Gaston had already died, that um, that it was their gun. They had borrowed it from the Ravu, the innkeeper, uh, because Rene was playing cowboy all summer. He was wearing a Buffalo Bill costume. The, the, uh, the, International Exposition in Paris had just taken place, and the most uh, popular keepsake from that exposition was a Buffalo Bill costume, Buffalo Bill having been a pr principal uh, feature of the exposition. And so he used this gun as a prop along with the costume as he sort of played cowboy across the countryside around Auvers. Um We also heard that that the uh, that even though no one saw Van Gogh being shot or shooting himself, that he that someone saw him the day of the death go into a farmyard um, near the Ravu Inn, and th this person heard a gunshot and didn't see anybody come out of it uh, of the of the farmyard. So the implication is that he didn't die up in the wheat field; he died in this farmyard near the Rabu Inn, which would have been a much more, it was much more plausible that Van Gogh could have walked from that farmyard back to the inn than that he could have climbed down from the escarpment with this uh, bullet in his stomach. Um, then, then, we, then we read that a rumor uh, related by John Rewald, the greatest uh, historian of Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, who lived in Paris during the 1930s, before World War II, uh, studying at the Sorbonne, and he would take trips to Auvers, not only because Van Gogh lived there, but also uh, Pizarro lived nearby, Cezanne had spent some time there. Um, uh, there were other artists of the era who summered there, and uh, when he was there in the 1930s, there were people who had been very much alive and even grown up when Van Gogh died. And the rumors he heard from them was that Van Gogh had not shot himself, that he'd been shot by two young bullies. Well, the, the article from the Secretin um, brother um, and the fact that Secretin had the gun and that there were these rumors floating through the community of Auvers, that that's how he had died. And in the, in the rumors were that he had, uh, there was the fact that he had accepted the blame in order to protect these two guys from the from what you know the legal consequences of an accidental homicide, it, it, and, it, and that comported with the kind of generosity that um, he had shown Theo by leaving Paris uh, to move to Arles. Uh, it seemed in character with Van Gogh, and also provided 
in some ways a much more satisfying end to his life. Instead of uh, finally giving up after a life of resilience, you know, just accepting this death inflicted on him in this drunken incident and saving these two boys is a, is a, is a much nicer conclusion, but it's also one that seems to comport with the facts more accurately. It would explain why he, um, why the bullet was lodged in the stomach and not in the chest or the head. Um, it would, it, we, we supplied our argument and some of the uh, arguments for the suicide theory to one of the leading um, forensic experts, one of the, it's an, a, an expert particularly schooled in the difference between homicide and um, murder. Uh, he'd spent a guy named Vincent DeMeo who had spent his entire life analyzing those particular kinds of crime scenes. And he was definitive that Van Gogh was more likely um, uh, shot by somebody else than by himself, partly because of the trajectory of the wound and also because the two doctors who described the, the wound site did not mention that the, that the skin had been um, uh, scorched. And DeMeo said that the only kind of handguns that were available in rural France in 1890 had a kind of gunpowder that, that if, uh, if shot from close range, would have uh, scorched the skin around the entry, uh, wound entry. And he said it was impossible that the two doctors who described uh, the medical situation would have uh, would not have mentioned this most obvious fact, and I must say, in the years since we the book came out, um, I've actually become more certain of the of this death theory than than, than the suicide theory. Partly because of DeMeo's analysis, and partly because the other forensic experts who have looked both at our theory and at the earlier suicide theory have been conclusive to at least to us that um, that accidental homicide was more likely than than suicide. Um, it has begun to enter the popular culture in the form of the film um, Loving Vincent, which I believe you mentioned you saw. Yeah, I saw I saw that uh, I went to a screening of it and I was able to ask a question at the end of the filmmakers about this exact thing because they had the cooperation of the, uh, the Van Gogh museum. And, um, I asked if, uh, because the film entertains different theories of his death, whether or not the museum had changed their opinion on it at all. And they seemed to suggest that there was no definitive change, but a, a greater openness to other conclusions. So do you feel like this is something that's, because based on the evidence you've given, I mean, I guess we'll never definitively know, but it seems a lot less likely that he killed himself than uh, this theory you guys have. Um, do you think this is going to be sort of a generational thing that people are eventually going to come over? I, th I think that is likely. Uh, when the book, when the, when we wrote the book, we actually submitted it to several friends at the Van Gogh Museum, and these were the, the key experts on Van Gogh's life as opposed to the paintings. And um, they, were, they agreed with us that the accidental homicide was more likely than the suicide. Uh, the current researcher there um, is the one who's been so vehement about, um, uh, the, about the suicide theory. Uh, so that, that because he's there and the other people have all left the museum, uh, that theory seems to predominate. But as you noted, surprisingly, after uh, disagreeing so uh, uh, strongly with our theory, um, the, you know, the, this movie comes out and, they, and, and the entire museum throws itself uh, into, you know, into, their, into supporting this film. So... Um, you know, perhaps there's some softening there among, among those people. Uh, and, but the, um, uh, I think the forensic conclusions are really going to 
have an ultimate impact here. I mean, the, the fact is I've studied an awful lot of art history at some major institutions and there are no courses in forensics in art, in art history right. uh, departments. This is not really an art historical matter, it's a forensic one. So it seems to me that the forensic opinion is the one that will, should, should, um, uh, should win out here. Um, but also I think well, as, as this, the new ideas enter popular culture, in the form of the movie Loving Vincent and in other forms, I think there will be a, a change over time. And um, I'm proud that Greg and I helped um, inspire this at least uh, reassessment of how he died, especially since it provides, in our view, a more satisfactory um, and more accurate end to the life as he lived it. I mean, it, uh, it's really, it would be sad to think that after this life of extraordinary res resilience in the face of, of misery, that he would in the end kill himself. And, uh, um, you know, it, 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 the, the suicide, it's a very unsatisfactory uh, end to a life that was lived according to the precept, uh, sorrowful, but always rejoicing. And, um, so it will be interesting to see over time what, what, how the ad attitudes towards the death may change. Um, before we wrap up here, I wanted to ask you about your own uh, career as an artist. And I mentioned at the beginning of this that you grew up as the son of career U.S. diplomats. You got to absorb a lot of culture all around you um, from Middle East to Africa. Um, what role did these experiences play in your art? Um, and did your, did the artists that you studied in these biographies and while you're at school, uh, also have an impact? Uh, yes, I, I, I've painted since I was 10 years old, but I had to take a hiatus from it when I was about 25 because I had to, you know, I went to law school and then began this career as a writer and had to, and built a couple of companies and it just wasn't the time to paint. And about 15 years ago, I began painting again. And, um, the early work was, was really very heavily influenced by 20th century American and European abstraction, especially hard edge geometric abstraction. Uh, I particularly admired people like Frank Stella and the British, um, uh, with all of his shaped canvases and the British op artist, uh, Bridget Riley, as well as Saul LeWitt and Ellsworth Kelly and, and, and others. Uh, so my early work was really a matter of working my way through their styles. I would often um, uh, take their vocabulary and ask myself, what, what do I think they should have done using that vocabulary that they didn't do? And one such painting, the one based on Frank Stella, is now in the Princeton University Art Museum collection. And the one that was sort of uh, grew out of Bridget Riley is in the Columbus uh, Museum collection. And a, a work that was based on both Joseph Albers and Ellsworth Kelly is, um, it looks like it's going to a, another Midwestern uh, museum. Um, but then when I came back to making art, later in life, uh, I, I had spent a good deal of time looking at, at the art of my childhood in the Middle East and the geometric abstraction there and realizing the incredible synergy between mid, you know, 20th century European American ge geometry and the geometry of the Middle East in the, in the, in the year 1000. And, uh, so, uh, as I began to sort of plan the work more, more intentionally, more, uh, cerebrally. Um, I, I, I realized this, this sort of uh, combination of these two different strains. And I think it, uh, is, um, at, at this point in sort of world history, um, drawing connections between different civilizations is, is both uh, gratifying on an artistic level and not insignificant as a um, expression of of globalism and uh, the need for 
different civilizations to get along. Yeah. And then another thing I wanted to ask you about is um, you've kind of have an interesting perspective because you've been on both sides of the coin where there's art, uh, producing art, and then uh, the criticism or uh, uh, study of art. There's a, a, a part in Rainer Rilke's letter to a young poet where he advises the young poet to not read literary criticism because it'll uh, uh, sort of dull the flavor of poetry. Um, and obviously in the process of writing your biographies, you've had your own tangles with the art critical establishment. What's your perspective on the role of criticism or biography in art and for artists? Well, uh, you know, there is some really good criticism out there and that, that it can be really helpful at its best. It can be helpful in elucidating a work of art. It can be help. It can be helpful in letting us look at an art more care, uh, work of art more carefully and seeing it afresh. Um, but there's also a lot of nonsense criticism out there. Um, not just in art history, but in, um, I mean, I see it all the time. I, uh, I just finished the Patrick Melrose novels, uh, having seen the great Benedict Cumberbatch film, um, series based on them. And I went back and looked at some of the reviews and even though most of the reviews were appropriately sensational, um, and, you know, call it one of the great achievements of the last however many decades, um, you know, there were some really disturbingly uh, negative reviews and there were some reviews that were just downright silly. And that's really true of any art form. So for a artist who's kind of, you know, a young artist contemplating a life in the arts, uh, my advice would, based on my experiences, would be twofold. On the one hand, you know, don't let it get to you. And also don't drink of it too deeply, as uh, Wilkie, I think, was um, was suggesting. Don't let it change your, your 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 artistic process, your creative process, your thought process too too much, because you don't want to lose your the access to whatever it is that is motivating you to make this art of any kind in the first place. On the other hand, a successful artistic career involves getting the art out into the public. It, it, it is it is a business as well as a, an art form. And therefore, the critics are potentially terribly valuable to you. There's uh, to, to talk about the two artists we've been discussing uh, without Clement Greenberg, you know, it would have been a harder, it would have been harder for Pollock to achieve the renown that he did. Without Albert Aurier, it would have been harder for Van Gogh to achieve what he did. So, and, and I would argue that both Greenberg's criticism and certainly Aurier's were pretty silly um, for the most part. Uh, but they certainly had a role in bringing these two major artists to world attention. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, I think a young artist has to be flexible enough to, you know, accept the, you know, be happy with the good criticism, you know, not get too deeply mired in the bad criticism, um, not let criticism uh, change their art dramatically, but also be aware that critics can play an incredibly useful role in in developing a, an audience for whatever it is someone wants to make. Well, on that note, I want to thank you again very much for taking the time to talk with me. And uh, this was a real treat. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Well, it's been a real pleasure, Duncan. As, um, I think I may have told you, uh, uh, you really have read these two books thoroughly and carefully. And uh, there is no greater reward to a writer, including a biographer, than an audience that takes what they, that, that really uh, immer uh, immerses them itself in, in the books and spends the kind of time these are, 900 pages a piece. It takes a lot of time and to read them as carefully as you have is, is the greatest reward that uh, a writer can have. And so thank you so much for this interview. And um, um, I hope maybe other people will read the books based on the conversation that we just had. Absolutely. Alrighty. Take care. Thank you so much. 
Okay, folks, that's it. Thank you once again to Stephen Nafee for joining us. You can find his books on Amazon and wherever books are sold, really. I highly recommend them. Stay tuned next week. Bye-bye.